Welcome back to Travoltine Presents Easy Riders. Hosted by Jeff Sweeney and Stuart Elmore. Covering how to make an American quilt with special guest Ange Gardner. They're just saying, in America, you can't make quilts anymore. We used to be able to make quilts. We used to make tremendous quilts. They're the best quilts. You can't make a quilt anymore. It's terribly sad. Sleepy Joe, sleep at the wheel. My grandmother used to make the best quilts, and I asked her, and she said, you could always make a good quilt, but you got to talk to her about it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do the impression that you can, but I do. Yeah. The They're saying that it's the best quilt. It's a wedding quilt, a quilt that you take with your wedding. At now listen, folks, folks, we used to make great quilts in America, uh, and we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. Uh, it's, it's about, it's, it's the economy. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something about, about quilts. No, number one, <laughs> <laughs> the patches. I can't believe we're impersonating political figures in a movie that I felt like had no political standing at all. It didn't. It could have, it it has could have the not title. been in America if it wasn't it, titled at, American sure. Quilt. <laughs> it did have it in the title, so I can't say that. See, this, this movie's actually about the fabric of the 20th century and how we've, we've quilted uh, a... No, it doesn't. That's, 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 that's the first one right there, uh, the fabric. Uh, there's going to be a lot of quilt puns in this whole thing. Um, oh, I didn't prepare any quilt puns. Hold on, pause. Okay, I'm going to come up with some material. Yeah, I'm sure you could stitch a few up, you know. Ah! <laughs> Damn. Uh. Oh, God. See, the thing is, I got to savor some so you could use them. But mm -hmm. uh, And I'm so glad you're here today for this episode. I'm so I'm glad, too. Glad. I was thinking as I was watching the movie that in many ways, since the last time I talked on this show, I have shaped myself so that I can talk about this movie yes. with you guys today. I, I number one just value your friendship and your presence here, but also you picked this movie based solely on the title. Yeah, I really, I really said, mm, quilt. And then okay. I started watching this movie and I was just like, all right, yeah. Um, and then like about two minutes in, I was just like, oh, this is the, I'm, this is a perfect Ange Gardner movie. It really yeah. is an Ange Gardner movie. I, I didn't know that when I started watching it. I'm so happy that I get to talk about it because mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time talking about it with my partner who I watched it with. So I have in front of me, as you can see, some notes I had. Yeah. I don't know if you guys want to hear my predictions of whether or not I thought you guys liked the movie. Mm -hmm. what I, I don't I think I thought Stuart would have hated this movie. I, th I was thinking about it. I was watching it. I was like, Stuart hates this movie. Jeff saw Jared Leto and stopped watching. the movie. <laughs> 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 okay, Jeff saw good. Jared Leto and was like, hmm. Jared Leto's in this movie. This movie is Jared Leto. <laughs> um, I'm going to delay the Jared Leto conversation because I think in context, it's maybe one of the wildest things a movie has done that I've seen in years. <laughs> There's a lot of wild things this movie does. Uh, I I don't know if we should just get to it and start with it right away. I, I did like this movie. Really? I well, let me let me let me preface real quick. I think the worst part about this movie is when on a writer. One thousand percent. That's in my notes. Yes, yeah. I felt I was like, can I say that on a podcast about when yes, on a writer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the best parts about this movie is everything without when on a writer. I think a lot of people also agreed with you. If I yeah. look back at the reviews that came out when the movie came out, uh, when on a writer was not popular of this yeah. movie. Now to be. Fair though, I will say, like reading what the Wikipedia will say are like the lessons that each of the women learn. Mm -hmm. Totally disagree with them. Yeah. Have you read like? Have you guys read like what like each of them are supposed to like kind of learn at the end, as per the author of the Wikipedia says? I don't know if what the director yeah, is writer this says from the book or is this like because I know this that is the each... movie Wikipedia page. Are okay. You, are hot. you are you telling me like Wikipedia editor twenty seven ninety seven boner like? has decided he's going to have takes and he's going to make them the official takes of Wikipedia. I don't know. It's crazy. I don't know. I know that the filmmaker with each vignette took a lot of each one was supposed to have a very distinct feel by tone. Mm -hmm. Like one is a melodrama. One is a little more serious. One is a fable. Like they were each a different kind of movie within a movie mm -hmm. to make yeah. them feel separate. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't feel like there were lessons in this movie so much as it was a commentary. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, but I'll, I'll wait till they get, maybe I literally just disagree with the Wikipedia <laughs> and that's it. I agree with the movie. I disagree with the Wikipedia. Let me, I'll say that. 
like just real quick, one little thing I'm going to throw in. Yeah, there. I'd be curious to hear what they think uh, is important. So Sophia Darling, um, it says, and we're spoiler for like the very end. Years later, when the wind blows part of Finn's thesis under the pond, she wades in again with her feet, with her feet in the pool. She remembers what her husband tried to remind her of all those years ago. And one of the last scenes shows her diving off the high dive. That 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 doesn't do as good as I thought it would be. Well, I think. It, it phrases in a way of like the husband cared about her all along, and it's like that piece of shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's his name? Yeah, Greg. what I the first note that I wrote down, which I think is the central part of this movie, and what I thought was super interesting, and probably a lot of what I'm going to talk about is like women are always at a disadvantage in marital relationships, but no one wins a fight. Yeah, like no one in this movie, and I thought it was super cool for this. No one in this movie was perfect. No one in this movie was evil. Mm. No one in this movie was right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree it's all that. just it's just tracking these relationships over time. Yeah, and looking back on them with so much perspective. Yeah, but it, to just take the big step back, movie good, one and a writer bad. Yeah, I I, I really really like the movie. I thought Winona Ryder got dealt a bad hand with the script and maybe with some direction. But I will say, after seeing Oppenheimer, Emily Blunt got dealt a bad hand and ate that shit up, no crumbs. Yes, yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know if that's an excuse I can give anymore mm. that was like, oh, well, her character didn't have a lot for her to work with, but her character did not have a lot for her to work with. Mm. And also, yeah. I didn't like it. I mean, she did fine. I think she, I think Winona Ryder conveyed some very important emotions and probably exhibited what her character would be feeling, which is vulnerable, sensitive, mm -hmm. confused, whiny. Like, I think you feel that way when you're not secure in where you are. Mm -hmm. Um not fun to watch, but right. I think it's hard as a performer when the when basically the whole plot of your movie, and this isn't the only movie that's done this, but it's you know very evident example where your whole function in the movie is someone who's lost and confused and doesn't know their way, and you learn it by listening to stories Other being told stories by the most interesting elder ladies to ever exist. So to back up. Like and, she's just purely a cipher. Yeah, I was gonna say to back up and give the audience like who is listening to this like an idea. I because this movie is how, how how like I don't know how much movie this made and how widely known this movie is. To my knowledge, I've never heard of this movie before. It's the last movie made by Kathleen Kennedy's production company before it was bought by DreamWorks. Oh. It was a production Amblin. success. Yeah, Amblin. It made forty million on a ten million budget, uh -huh. but it wasn't nominated for any Oscars. It yeah. won a Screen Actors Guild. I think it was like touching the edge of the indie like yeah. ceiling. Okay, and so, it looks like it too. Yeah, so not very widely known. So no. just to like kind of paint the rough, rough picture of the audience. Then Jeff, I know you probably have some yeah, context. I do. This is a movie about uh, one underwriter who plays Finn. Um, Finn. Finn Dodd. Uh, Finn Dodd. Name. It's a good name. Finn Dodd, who is Finn. Re recently engaged to uh, Sam. Her now Sam. fiance Sam. Fuck him. Played by. Wow. Um, That's a, okay. Put a pin uh, in that. Agreed. Agreed. Fuck him. Which was another. Th that was the Sam's other part of the moke. movie that like I was kind of like. Eh. And she ends up with Sam. It's like. I don't know. Again, we talked about how like are there I'll, really I'll any wait lessons for the in context this movie? Is done, but I've got some questions here. Well, like we talked about, like is there really any lessons in this movie? And to that point, I agree with you, Ange. But I just think like with all these stories you're hearing about, like and one of the things I agree with you the most, it's like no one is good in, in any of these like situations. But like a lot of the men are pieces of shit in this movie. Yeah, and I think this movie is about women's perspective, and I think it's about some of the cycles of abuse women have gone through, especially mm -hmm. in times when they didn't have any power. Yeah. Kind of tough for men to be portrayed super solid here. Right. But I also don't think any of the men we saw were like irredeemably bad. I don't think mm -hmm. anybody had fangs and a big black cloak and was like, ha ha ha. I hate women. It's like, you are just like misogyny hurts women and men, right? Like the patriarchy does. I think yeah. this movie was like, Especially with um, Sophia Darling's husband, right? Yeah. He was subject to the same problem she was subjected to. He wanted her to come with him, but she couldn't. They had a kid, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And like Dean is a character who like is portrayed pretty negatively throughout the whole movie, right? And at the end, there's like a certain degree of sympathy toward him, right? Is that earned? I thought it was more 
the movie felt, I didn't feel like the movie said we should sympathize for this man. I thought it was, we understand him. Yeah. Empathy instead of sympathy. I yeah. think you're right. I, I got who Dean was. I've met mm-hmm. people like Dean. Uh, I don't know if I feel sorry for him as much as I think, you know, yeah, I, like that's that. the thing. I don't feel so sorry for him either. And that's where like, I was a little bummed at the, his little ending of like, you know, like there is like a good connection there between like the two of them. His, his way of and, expressing his love was through art, but he could never verbalize. Right. His love. Well, I think he did verbalize his love. I, what I got from Dean was this is someone who is a sexual deviant in a time where you can't talk about it and there are no tools to understand it. Mm. Yeah. Like over and over again, he's like, I'm really sorry. This isn't who I want to be. And I think from a modern standpoint, because we know what the word gaslighting means now that we saw that and we're like, Oh, he's manipulating her. And I don't know that he's not, but I also certainly that actor I didn't think was portraying like, Oh, I'm purposefully Mm -hmm. manipulating you. What is it? Manipulation is knowledge of how to hurt somebody without the empathy of hurting them. Mm -hmm. Like he feels for her. Sorry. That was, that was (laughs) good. That was good. Uh, (laughs) Because the, the whole thing where, like, he goes and picks her up from her parents, right? It's the same mm-hmm. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Like, that is just kind of, like, the nail in the coffin for me and his, like, character in that point. Because now I'm like, okay, it... it And to your point, Andrew, right, it's like, this is in a world where, like, w- women don't have, like, any power to say no to Yeah, her parents like, packed the car. Right, exactly. They know and, the story, and she couldn't stay there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to that point, it's like, you feel... First off, you hate the parents you hate the time period you hate the culture but i also kind of like hate him too in that moment i think i think you can because i think we're seeing it from her perspective Mm -hmm. right so then when it goes to the end of the movie and it tries to kind of like play that little note of empathy i'm just like "Ah." this movie is about the in a lot of ways the like the nature of forgiveness yeah i i wrote down and may agreed with me my partner um this movie couldn't be made today the way blazing saddles couldn't be made today Mm mm-hmm because it's like, oh, my God, you couldn't make this movie today and nobody would get it. It's like, I don't think you could make this movie today. Nobody would get it because yeah. it is all about gray characters and flat forgiveness. And like, I'm broken. You're broken. Let's be broken together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm-mm, mm-mm, well, not then... media today anymore. I don't feel like I, I thought this movie had some really incredible nuance that mm-hmm. I do not feel like I see nowadays. Well, and to that very point, and like even the poem that's written to... um uh that's even written to uh alfred woodard's character mariana yeah the Uh, quote poem yeah young lovers seek perfection old lovers learn the art of sewing shreds together and of seeing beauty in a multiplicity of patches i I feel like um going off what you just said about this movie not being made today i feel a lot um when people bring up blazing saddles like you couldn't make blazing saddles today the argument that I'm always subscribed to is like, you don't have to make blazing saddles today. That's Culture true. has changed so much. There's no reason to make blazing saddles today. I think that's very fair. I will say uh, I just saw blazing saddles yeah. for the first time, like a month yeah. ago, kind of a killer movie. I was mm-hmm. really, yeah. really happy great. with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing as like people are, you couldn't make Tropic Thunder today. And I'm like, there's no reason to make Tropic Thunder today. Like mm. these movies exist as like in the context of all that, like, like they were made in. Like Blazing Saddles is such a product of like 1970, I forget the year, 75 or so when it came out. This movie feels like so very locked into the 95, like this early 90s movement of, you know, women's liberation. That was. Yeah, this was uh, this would have been second. Are we in second wave feminism or third wave feminism at this point? Because I think second wave was the 70s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we've hit third wave at this point. Like it's 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 a period. I don't know exactly the wave, um, but I know it's a period of like women, especially in the fields of art, are gaining a lot more control and power. Yeah. Um, whether that be as producers, it was directed by a woman, Jocelyn Morehouse. Oh yeah, I I look in the credits all the time. I usually wait until yeah. I can see the first women woman. Sorry, just mm-hmm. one. Uh, I had trouble finding a man. Yeah. I think unless the DP was a man, I think the first male name that i saw was music which was amazing i loved the soundtrack for this movie mm-hmm. thomas newman uh yeah. this movie was shot by a man janusz kaminski was spielberg's guy um but i did Gotta respect it did you see spielberg financed this movie yes he did king he's, shit. he's cool like that he king is shit. cool like that well yeah. i feel like i have to go see the fablemans now that's like an act of respect because <laughs> this movie spielberg is the best he, he's always like doing stuff for other filmmakers but um this movie is amblin is his company that um he 
founded for his first movie is called Amblin. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he leaves Amblin to make DreamWorks in the mid nineties. And like you oh, said, oh, so when it was bought by DreamWorks, it just got reabsorbed. It's just him folding. His, oh, okay. His, his I didn't know that himself. piece of context when I was reading yeah. that. That's actually essentially cool. Sp- Amblin is just like a production company. It just made movies for studios. Spielberg in the mid nineties, after he won the Oscars, like, you know what? What if I made a studio mm. that releases its own movies? Like I don't go through Universal or Paramount or Disney or anything. I just make my own studio. And so he gets with Jeffrey Katzenberg, and I always forget who the fuck the G is in SKG, and forms DreamWorks SKG, mm, um, okay, which exists for about 15 years. And then it, DreamWorks still exists today, but it's, it's just like it makes animated movies for other studios now. And yeah. Spielberg has gone back to mostly make movies for Universal. But for like 15 years, DreamWorks was pumping out like it was all of his movies. It would be um, like it did Transformers, Shrek. It would just... Did DreamWorks? It was not... I was going to say Nickelodeon did Rango. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that was a different world. Sorry. I think Rango is Paramount and Nickelodeon. Yeah. Because they had a partnership. Sorry, Um, I got to throw Rango in wherever I can. You got to hype up the boys. Got to hype up my boys. So before we delve further into the plot of this movie, I would like to jump back for some context. Just of like, where we're going Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's all good. Context for uh, so we're picking up right after Little Women, which we talked about last week. Thank you for listening to our episode. Um, thank you, Charlie, for being on that episode. Uh, so Little Women, um, big success for Winona. She gets the Oscar nomination off of oh, it. Oh, really? Yes. And she takes a little bit of time off, but then this is her next project. She's very attracted to the, you know, the story. She likes playing these types of lost characters who are just kind of trying to discover themselves. Mm-hmm. It's a, you know, she's played it many times before. Um, and... But she, her biggest like selling point was the opportunity to work with like some of the the elder women who are in this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, she said like throughout the entire production, she kept getting asked, "What's it like to work with all these icons?" Um, and anytime she'd bring that up to like Ellen Burstyn or Maya Angelou, they would just laugh at her and then be like, "We're icons, aren't we?" And would like <laughs> <laughs> talk to the director and be like, "You have to refer to me as an icon." Mm-hmm. Um, but her direct quote about it was, I seem to get attracted to characters who are really confused, probably because I'm really confused most of the time. Um, it'd be funny if I cut it off right there. Uh, but she said, no, but I thought it was a great way of showing someone who's trying to figure out what to do with their life. The script is very subtle, beautiful, and I immediately connected with it and wanted to be a part of it. And uh, the majority of the crew was female. Um, mm-hmm. Anne Bancroft, who is mm-hmm. one of the uh, the women in the movie, said it was the first time in the career where there were no men in the room. When she walked in for the rehearsal, uh, she thought she'd died and gone to heaven. Wow. You got to respect it. You really got to respect it. I feel a little bit bad for panning Winota's performance at the beginning of this yeah. podcast because truly I do think she did a good job. It's just tough when the rest of the movie is also yeah. really good. I I don't blame her. For, I mean, I blame her for the voiceover performances. That's it. Yeah, so I'm so I'm so sorry for cutting you off. Please continue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, like you can definitely jump in. Her her voiceover work in this movie is Blade Runner esque. Yeah, it's Harrison Ford uh, and the original cut. Of I was work, wondering if yeah. maybe they just had a day to do it, and they got it. They had to get it done fast. <laughs> like maybe they threw her in at the end of the day. I know that we've done that yeah. with actors, but I, I I don't know what was it was. She was thinking something. And when they made the first Blade Runner movie, Mm -hmm. um, the studio was like, this doesn't make any sense. We need to add narration to explain everything. And they had the contract with Harrison Ford. And they're like, you're coming in. You're going to record this voiceover. And he's like, all right, I'm going to make it so bad that there's no way they can use it. And so he comes in and and every line, he's just like, I was a Blade Runner back in this time. It was crazy. And then they put it in the movie. And so you watch the theatrical cut of Blade Runner and it is the worst voiceover I've ever heard in a movie. He sounds like the most joyous, like jolly guy. It really, the house always wins. Yeah. Speaking right? in like, monotone. Yeah. Um, And then everyone's like, what the hell is this? This movie sucks. And then they took the voiceover out and re-edited the movie. And they're like, oh no, this is good. Actually. <laughs> That's what it's going on. Oh wait, dude, is this good? Is this good? Yeah. Uh, but I don't believe Winona was trying to sabotage this movie in the no, same way he was. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I, we, I texted you this, Jeff, where I said like, this movie follows a very similar uh, through line process as movies we've actually talked about before and a lot of movies that people have probably seen before. So like, one thing I brought up was a movie Now and Then mm-hmm. uh, as being like a movie where the the main focus, or I guess like 
it's hard to say like the protagonist is not the main focus. I don't know if I'm even saying that right. Mm-hmm. But like now and then you get like these four older women who are now all coming back together because one of them is about to have a baby. And then like 80% of the movie is all flashbacks going back to all their childhood mm-hmm. and them growing mm-hmm. up. Very Stand By Me-esque like. Mm-hmm. And though mm-hmm. that's like the interesting bits of the movie. But then every time it comes back to the adult version, you're just like, I don't care about this at all. And I feel like a yeah. similar thing happens with this movie where it's like every time we then go back to Winona, it's like, uh, I don't know. I'm not really yeah. in this. I'm not as interested in this as I am in making sure that these old women are okay. Like, yeah. I want them to be happy. Right, right. In so, their little quilting lodge. So to that point, like I agree that I don't think it's fully like Winona's fault that she's not like a super great aspect yeah. of the movie, in my opinion. Yeah. Because ha- it's hard to be in a I don't think like she's this. bad. I think she's just boring. Yeah. I think it's tough to watch a character who is... You know, I I think her core character trait, like if she was in The Sims and she had three traits and that's mm-hmm. it, non-committal would be the first one. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's tough to watch a non-committal character, especially when we as watchers, more than people, are very committal, right? Yes. Like, yeah. oh, I like this character. I yeah. don't like this character. We don't feel that way when we meet people often. Yeah. yeah. So right, we're in the mood to be committal, right? That's why. Yeah. We love fantasy and stuff like that. It's like, yes, there's good guys and bad guys. And then when it's a character who's like, I'm know. starting my thesis for the third time. I'm confused about being yeah. engaged. I don't know if I like this person or not. It's like, well, I know. Mm-hmm. And I want you to feel the way I feel. So mm-hmm. I think it it makes sense to me why I didn't love it. Because we're going to run into this issue in a few movies again with Girl Interrupted. Mm-hmm. Um which is a movie where Winona is playing the lead and she is expected to get an Academy Award nomination. And then Angelina Jolie just absolutely overshadows her in the movie. Nobody talks about Winona in that movie. It's the Angelina Jolie show, even though Winona is the main character. Is she the girl interrupted? She is. She gets interrupted. By Angelina Jolie. Yeah, quite literally. By another girl. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, And so it's just kind of that thing of like, it just like if this movie was just Winona Ryder on her like third thesis struggling in the world and she's like you know maybe having an affair with a guy and none of this like none of the older woman or the quilting was actually involved in the movie i would probably be more invested in that storyline because that's the storyline right but when the movie is that and then there's six more interesting storylines also happening i naturally gravitate towards what is more interesting Mm -hmm. right also i want to loop back to you bringing up now and then because and this this is a movie like Stuart said where it jumps between two time periods and there's like mm-hmm. the young girls and then the are you bringing up the Rosie O'Donnell thing? <sighs> you ruined it. Because <laughs> every time you I bring it up, it. you always bring up the Rosie O'Donnell say, thing. And Christina Ricci plays Rosie one of the girls. O'Donnell. It was in this movie. Oh my God. Stuart ruined my bit. <laughs> I was going to tell you, tell you Christina Ricci plays one of the girls and ask you to guess who she grows up to be, and it is Rosie O'Donnell because it's very funny because Christina Ricci is just like, yeah, this is just how I talk. I'm just like this, and then. Rosie O'Donnell walks in. He's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? All right, we got to get these, get the, get the, get the mushrooms in here. Get the pizza in here. All right, come on. We got to make this thing. She's going to have a baby. She's going to have a baby. You see that bump? That baby's, she's huge. She's huge. And it's like, just no, absolutely no connection between the two. It's funny because I know you guys don't live together and I know you guys aren't married to each other. And yet sometimes I hear you talk and even I myself get fooled. I'm like, <laughs> oh wow, marital bliss. And then I'm like, hold on a second. Hold on cute it's it's just like one of the old ladies (laughs) yeah i i fully expect and only only the utmost respect to your partners but i think you two are going to get old and live together in a house (laughs) we're going to have a tim burton situation where there's two houses with a tunnel connecting them (laughs) no i hate it no no, jeff this is what we're going to have we're going to we're going to have the uh the gladdy and gladdy joe clearly and high dodd relationship where Mm -hmm. like you move in with me or i move in with you and we have a wall of just all the destroyed uh objects we throw at each other for how mad we are can i can i talk a little love to this movie for a second yeah i felt like and i since you guys last talked to me on this podcast, I've kind of switched careers and I spend a lot of my time now as a fiber artist. Mm-hmm. I'm a big knitter and needle pointer. Um, and I was like, I know quilts, quilt movie. Like, I don't quilt myself, but I'm like, I know what this is. Um, and that the movie itself was so interconnected and uh, the room with the broken objects being one, this like huge room of broken objects, but also 
all of Gladie Joe's scenes being like, I haven't figured out my artistic purpose yet. Mm -hmm. I'm still like my sister plays the piano, but I'm trying to figure out what's important to me. And then at the end when she's, it's been destroyed and she's destroying it as this final act of forgiveness. That's when I was sitting there like, oh, this movie is on something. Like this mm -hmm, movie yeah. is not, it's, it's almost diamond in the rough, it, right? Like, cause I, I looked at this movie and I was like, mm, soft nineties movie. I know what this will be. And then I was like, oh, I'm crying. <laughs> I'm weeping on my couch. Mm. Yeah, I was watching this with uh, my partner Angelica last night, and uh, or at least the second half of it, and it was um, it, it it was this. I think it's Lewis Smith, Sophia. She's mm -hmm. a swimmer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was when Lewis Smith like got into the small pond and started wading in the water, and uh, where I just looked over at her, it's like, see, this is the juice of the movie right here, yeah. and then and then it, literally it cuts to. Winota and I thought this is not <laughs> the juice of the movie. Did, did all of us watch this movie with our partners? Because this is not an easy movie to watch with your partner. The Cor entire yeah. movie is about infidelity. It, it, I watched yeah. it alone. <laughs> Smart man, <laughs> my man. That was a good movie. I, I put it on and my wife uh, said no interest and walked into the other room. Oh darn it! Okay, it is. It would be like a hard movie to watch with a partner for sure. Um, yeah, certainly like. My first date movie was always The Avengers. Like, I would just put that on in high school and I would not finish it. Uh, but this movie, you could not do that. This movie would be very difficult. It is not one of those movies. You, I think, both have to pay attention and also just cry. It's I think, so beautiful. I think yeah. a lot that if I was, like, eight years younger than I currently am, throwing Dune on for the first date, just sitting there... <laughs> And then, like, making her sit there with me and watch all two hours and 45 minutes of Dune with no interruption. With or without the popcorn bucket. With the popcorn bucket. <laughs> but we're putting popcorn in it. <laughs> what else would you put in it? I'm yeah. not getting paid what for else? this, right? Like, what else would you put in it? <laughs> all right. I, anyway, <laughs> any more context in this movie, Jeff? Um, not really much in the way of the making of the movie. We um, mentioned it's based on a novel, right? Yes. Okay. No. Yeah. All the women. We did it. Not, not to me. I, think I knew it was based on a novel because I read about the novel after I watched the movie, which I think is really interesting for one. Uh, they didn't in the book. No one knows that Dean cheats on his wife. It's not public mm, knowledge in the book. Interesting. Wow. I know that changed that. That was the only piece I read about what changed between the book and the movie. And also that. Sophia Darling's youngest daughter gets pregnant at 16. Oh, wow. I know two solid things. And yeah. I was like, it makes sense to me why you would cut those things. Like, right. you know, taking a book into a movie, things are going to change. But I read those and I was like, whoa, I should read the book. And, and it's, it, there's another layer of why it's also so glad that we have you here to talk about this because I as do you know were how just, to read. Well, no, you were just talking about how, you know, you were watching this with your partner and your partner was with us for an episode two episodes ago, House mm -hmm. of the Spirits, an example of a poor book to movie adaptation of, yes. of which the book, as we talked about in that episode, that book is like unadaptable basically. Yeah. Also about cycles of abuse. Right. Yeah. Whereas this movie I feel like is, and speaking of somebody who's not read the novel whatsoever, like I, what are you looking at? You're looking nothing, at the Wikipedia. Nothing, no. uh, where I feel like, like I, whether I, since I haven't read this novel, it's hard for me to tell like what's missing and what's not missing. But like, as just watching the movie and knowing what was adap adapted, like it was hard for me to figure out. It's like, what, what's a, what's a chunk missing from here that yeah. what's, I didn't feel like there was a gap in this movie. Yeah. Really. May clocked immediately. This is probably a book and I don't know this for a fact, but I believe it to be true because she said it and I believe everything she says, mm -hmm. that it's one of those every other chapter books. Mm. So you get the scene of the past and then the present and the past and the present over and over again. And it felt to me kind of like that ebb and flow of the yeah. sea. Yeah. Like I felt yeah. myself being kind of rocked back and forth, which I enjoyed. I did. I felt like they did a really good job with that. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that like, uh, uh, you talked about this too on the house spirit, like the form, um, the compatibility yeah. of the form to it. That is a very cinematic form that you can adapt pretty yeah. easily. Like we've seen that in so many book to movie adaptations. Yeah. Uh, that do that like chapter a one. A lot of books are very hard past. to adapt into movies. Right. But the form as we're talking about is both effective in a literary yeah. sense as well as a cinematic sense. I also yes. think, and I don't know how they would have translated this into the book. Maybe I should have read the book before I came on this podcast. Um, but having each of the fabrics from the memories be incorporated into the quilt. 
if I could roll that up in a joint and smoke it, I would. It was <laughs> awesome. I felt so I felt so cool having recognized that these fabrics were being pulled out and having it feel like a very textile, like um, tactile, beautiful mm-hmm. movie. And then having it all be because I caught the shirt, yeah, her husband's shirt and the flowers and how she wouldn't change the flowers. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, because it's her husband's shirt. And I was like, wow, I'm so smart that I caught that one instance and no other. <laughs> yeah. And then the movie was like, hey, took me by the shirt pulled up a fist, boom, right hook, boom, right hook, over and over again into yeah. my face. And I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. And and that's a compliment to the filmmakers. Truly, it, truly, it, truly. It, it really is like, I mean, I'm, I, yeah. I'm, as, as, as if you're reading that in the book, I'm sure it's like just as like moving and effective, but the way I feel like it was presented in the film itself, just really, really yeah. good. Yeah, whoever did the costumes was, is probably my soulmate and I should find them and be with them because I, I especially think for, especially for women and especially for older women, sometimes they get dressed in movies so bland Mm -hmm. and so flat. And it's like, if you've lived for 60, 70, 80 years, your closet is a collection of memories and you wouldn't dress like a weirdo. Like you, I -hmm. mean, I know some people, I know some older women who dress in black turtlenecks and jeans and they look great, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But there's also so many people who wear beautiful, like intricate pieces of clothing and especially quilters, people who Mm -hmm. sew and create like I'm in a knit club. A lot of the people in the knit club are not my age, but they wear these most like intricate, beautiful sweaters and shawls. Mm -hmm. Right. You wear your art. So they would wear these like big silk robes and like beautiful, soft sweaters. It made a lot of sense to me. And I thought I felt very seen as a fiber artist and somebody who's in that community to have the customers be like, yeah, these people wouldn't dress in a white t-shirt. They did their research into. You I know. felt because I know they worked with the Quilters Union, the yeah. LA Quilters Union, when they made this movie. Um, so I'm sure I don't know if they asked or if they already knew. I know uh, two of the actors and Bancroft and someone else had quilting experience. Mm-hmm. So maybe came from that as well. I don't know. Finn Dodd's red jacket. Yeah, I am buying. Finding it online. You're on the grind. The I am. Grind. The only thing I didn't like, and I think many other people would feel this way, is that she took the quilt outside. And I was like, if I got a brand new quilt that people took 75 hours to finish, not start, not complete, finish, you would not, not catch me dead outside. in the dirt. Yeah. <laughs> you would not catch me dead walking outside with it. It made sense. It was beautiful. Her running through the orchard with the crow. Ugh. What if it got dirty? Mm-hmm. So, do we want to start talking about this movie? Um, I do think, based you know, the structure of the movie is it yeah. basically one woman's story at a time, and so I think that's kind of how we'll tackle this. Yeah, yeah. Um, Real quick, Ange, is this cable getting in your face annoying? I like that it kisses me every time I try and talk. I in the see mic. it doing that, and I'm like, I don't know. I, I feel like that would bother me. Does it bother you? I can, no, no. You sure? I don't. I don't okay. want to stop. To I'm already on a roll. Uh, okay. For anybody who's wondering, the little cable of my mic is giving me little forehead kisses every time I try and talk. So <laughs> this movie this movie starts, and I'm immediately having the Vince McMahon meme with when the, with the credits rolling. <laughs> so it's like, it's like <laughs> it's hitting me with like oh. <laughs> Because I was just like, all right, who's in this thing? Let's find out. And it's like, we're not right. I'm like, obviously. Of course. <laughs> that's, like, that's why. This is the opening credits where you're like, yeah, duh. That's why and I'm watching this. And it's like, Anne Bancroft. I'm like, all right. Ellen Burson. Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> wait a second. Alfrey Woodard. Wait one goddamn second. Kate Capshaw. Dermot Mulroney. Rip Torn. <laughs> Michael T. Williamson. Anna Baldwin. Richard Jenkins. And then it hits me with like Claire Danes. Samantha. Anthem Mathis, I'm falling off my chair. I'm like doing backflips in the living room. I missed the first 30 minutes of the movie. Have I'm you even mentioned state. Maya Angelou? Oh yeah, Maya Angelou. I fucking my feet turn into rockets like Iron Man. I launched into orbit, so, surrounded the globe, and came back. I was losing my shit. I'm like, we're cooking with this cast. Yeah. You're telling me Rip Torn's in this bad boy? Rip Torn. Yeah, they said all star. No, oops, only stars. Like all <laughs> bangers only. Yeah. Stuart, did you clock that three out of the four little women are in this movie? Yeah. yeah um, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Winona, Claire Danes, Samantha, Samantha Mathis. Mathis. Um, whoever plays Meg, whose name I'm forgetting, uh, did not make the cut. Queen. Sad for her. Um, but oh, yeah, the other I, three. Uh, which one's Claire Dane doing? She uh, is. She's young Gladdy Joe. Young Gladdy oh Joe. Oh my God, she oh, is. Oh yes, she is. Yes, right. I 
I feel like I even clocked that when I watched yeah. it. Claire Danes, who we talked about last week, unfortunately ceased to exist in 2003. Yeah, sad. And did you know that Claire Danes ceased to exist in 2003? I didn't know that. She was a very, she was like the the, the ultimate uh, 90s actress. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, embodies that 90s I was talking about with my wife. And then she does Terminator 3 and then like ceases to exist. She just apparated out of existence. Yeah. Wasn't she just in something? She apparated out of existence. Has <laughs> okay. never been in something again. Didn't I just see her? <laughs> She's gone. Okay. Claire Danes ceased to exist. <laughs> Very sad. Yeah. Uh, don't know what happened to her. I hope she's, you know, in a better place. Um, uh, you know, cosmically. Anyway. Okay, so... <laughs> yeah, I, I thought the cast was great. Yeah. I also felt like... It probably makes sense because all these women probably really know each other. Mm. And if anybody else was doing Little Women, I felt like this was a really great interpretation of female relationships. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of stuff I'd seen before. Mm. I have a sister. Uh, I have a younger sister in college. And the idea of we have just done the most hurtful things we can ever do to each other. And I'm planning on ruining you to the, like, the absolute being of your core. And then walking into the room being like, I brought ice cream. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. no, I'm sorry. No, I forgive you. No, no, like, oh, c hug and make up. It's, <sighs> I can't take you down because you're the only person who's going to be with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got your second favorite flavor of ice cream <laughs> and I'm going to share it with your husband now. <laughs> Not doing the Watch first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really, and also Finn Dodd talking to her mother when it's like, you told me marriage was a sham. And she's like, I never said that. She's like, you said word for word, marriage is a sham. Well, maybe I changed my mind. It was like, May had to pause the movie. She was so upset because she grew up with lawyer parents. So she oh. never had, uh, everybody always had to come in with evidence. But I was like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah. Movies, this movie feels very emotionally honest in those moments. Like yeah. It, yeah. it captures like, like Kate Capshaw who plays uh, Finn's mom, just mm -hmm. like in that moment, like that, that feel that's real. Like just being like, yeah, maybe I said that when I was younger and just because I said it then doesn't mean I have to say it now. Yeah. I think that was a really interesting scene for me, especially coming off of the Barbie movie, which is, I think this is, this is the nineties version of the Barbie movie, mm -hmm. or perhaps the Barbie movie is the, how to make an American quilt of the 2020s, um, which is even though mothers are people, right? They're mm -hmm. people with flaws. You have a lasting effect on your child, yeah. whether or not you want to. Yes. So mm -hmm. you growing up being noncommittal and flighty has like affected, obviously affected Finn very deeply because mm -hmm. we see it over and over again in this movie. And then it's like, well, I've changed. Why can't you change? And it's like, because you made me this way. Like it's yeah. a very interesting dynamic back and forth i really yeah. really enjoyed it it's the same kind of dynamic that Cher has with winona in mermaids. mermaids yeah very much so um which was a lovely movie yeah um but it's the same thing of like except in that point in the movie Cher is still flighty and it's just like winona why are you so flighty and it's like because you're my mom yeah and like just because you want me to be something else doesn't mean i will unless you put the work into it yeah um is the argument of that movie i also felt like her conversation with Sam when he comes to show the plans, I thought um, was very gratifying that often we see women have those reactions where it's like, oh my God, you're being so irrational. You're bringing that out of nowhere. But we got all of the context this time, mm -hmm. which is, oh, you're engaged. When are you going to start having children? Mm -hmm. And it's like, my mother was never around for me. It's like she, uh, I think it's right after the pool, right? Where it's like she had unprotected sex once and was stuck with three children forever and her husband abandoned her, right? Like mm -hmm. if you grew up, I grew up in both rural and urban areas. And I also grew up surrounded by a bunch of different kinds of relationships. I was really lucky this wasn't in my own family, but I know people who went through financial abuse and emotional abuse and physical abuse. And it's when you know that you bring that into your relationship. Mm -hmm. Like I grew up seeing people get like financially unable to leave their partners May will watch me get cash out of the ATM and hide it in the house. Mm. I feel very safe in my relationship, mm. but there's something about my brain that feels safer knowing yeah. that I have a very, like a cash place that someone else can't touch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. and then when you go into that conversation, it's like, oh, we could maybe have a baby's room there. It's like, why the fuck would you bring that up? And it's, yeah. oh, you're being insane. Mm -hmm. I felt yeah. like the movie was very forgiving in that sense to be like, mm -hmm. 
well, there's a lot of other stuff happening that doesn't, that never would have yeah. touched you, Sam. Yeah. Bitch. Anyway. <laughs> Um, because you know, the movie does start with we we meet Finn Dodd and she's explaining like her life story more or less in in like this monotone is, narration. Is, I would say this is where we 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 get the yeah. Harrison Ford Blade Runner monotone because voiceover. she's been, she's more or less describing like that she has just jumped around between a lot of different paths in life, um, and she's currently in the process of writing her third thesis. Mm-hmm. Um, and by third, which is I mean, about textiles. Yeah, and she hasn't started. The first two theses she never filmed, and this is her third attempt to write her thesis. You said filmed. It was um, funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, she also is. Buddy. She's also having second thoughts about her engagement to her partner Sam, um, who is currently renovating their house. Um, yeah, a and, lot of upheaval. Yeah, mm-hmm. and is basically just kind of like a, a guy. Um, is there any talk in the book or in the Wikipedia how long they've been dating? Uh, I didn't catch this at all, but May was super frustrated that they're engaged and they have not had a conversation about whether or not they'd like to have kids. Yes. Because that does just come up when, you know, he's like, oh, this will be the baby's room. And it's later in the And movie. he's like, do you never want to have kids? It's yeah. like, you actually should have covered this. Yeah. That's an important topic. That Usually that comes up before getting engaged. Although that happens now in the 2020s. Yeah. It might not have in the 90s. There's, but. there's like a quick that could almost be thought of as like a throwaway line that I think actually is intended where she says while she's like in the house, it's being renovated. She's like, yep. And I'm engaged at 26. Some people would say that's early. I think that's the perfect time. And how quickly mm. it's just passed off. But in my mind, I thought of that as like, oh, they met like a year ago. Yeah. Kind of. I wonder. They either met a year ago or they're high school sweethearts. It's like, I don't think they just like started dating. Like They're not high school sweethearts. Not if you've never had that conversation. Yeah. yeah. So like in my mind, I my personal interpretation is like, oh, they met like a year ago and mm-hmm. like are now just like. Yeah. They're doing kind this. Going the, into it. They're, they're doing the standard thing. Like just, it's like, you know, you date long enough, you eventually move in and then you get married. And yeah. like, that's just that. That's the autopilot. Yeah. And I can say as someone who just got married at 26, the questions about, are you going to have kids come immediate? Oh, it yeah. is not, it is, there is no, there's no break to that. No build up. Like, no, there's not like, you know, build up. Yeah. No build up. It just happens. So you can understand Finn's like hesitation to jump into something. Well, especially. I shouldn't say jump, but go into a marriage. Yeah, knowing I that think, that's going to be the immediate. I took a lot of notes on this because I think this movie is a really interesting commentary on the deal of marriage is not a fair deal for women. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I don't think that's true nowadays. Anymore. Yeah. I, I would say that though, but I have, I'm with somebody who really loves me and mm. who wants me to succeed uh, like in my career and in my life and do exactly what I want to do and wants to support me. And I know not everybody has that luxury. Yeah. Like I don't think, anyway, my point being, uh, marriage is not a fair deal for women. And I think that's said over and over again, where it's like, I want to get yeah. out of here. I want to do this. I want to mm-hmm. live this life. And it's no. Yeah. You, that you are, you don't, you, that's not accessible to you. You're not yeah. pretty enough to be alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a line in the movie. I wouldn't say that to one of my friends sitting yeah. here. I want to make that very clear. They're yeah. both pretty enough to be alone. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, we're not alone because we got it. We have each other. That's so true with your tunnel house. So my, true. My. So true, bestie. My partner's in the other room, so <laughs> <laughs> keep this up. Um, yeah, Jeff, we have to stop hitting on Stuart because Angelic is right there. Hey, Stuart. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. So <laughs> you want to play with my sandworm, Finn. <laughs> Finn Dodd went on a writer um, who, as we as what we've already described, but she is spending three months over the summer. Yes, with her grandmother, her grandmother, and her grandmother's friends. To, or her quilting yes. cl- cl- to write a quilt, uh, to write a, a, a to write a quilt, to write a thesis about how quilting is where love resides. That's well, not true. Yeah, yeah no. Who, who, who wrote that down? They're making the qu- the quilt that's being made. Oh, that's the theme of that's well, the theme yeah, of the she quilt. Go, being made. She goes out there to finish her thesis and think about getting married. Yeah. And yes. he's like, "Are you leaving because you don't want to marry me?" And she's like, "No, I just need three months of space to think about it. I'm excited. I said yes, but just give me a little bit of space. I'm going to finish my thesis. I'm going to go work with my grandmother like I've done every other year." She gets there and she's like, "Oh, what competition are you making this quilt for?" And it's like, "The quilt is for you." you. We're making it for your wedding. And she's like, I can't fucking escape. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the theme of the quilt is where love The theme resides. of the quilt is where love is. Her my, thesis, my which I think is really interesting, is about specifically textile art 
and music in like I want to say certain parts of Africa is her thesis of like how mm. it's also a religious thing, right? Like that's said in the movie. I'm not making that up. Yeah, yeah. I thought is there is there something with it too about like the community aspect of it? I thought I read something in like a subtitle of hers that it was like the community of like textiles. Yeah, and I, art I or think like I think that. it's like the the art of making holds more than just the art of making. It is community. It is spiritualism. It is practical. It yeah. is artistic. Yeah, and that's what her thesis is on. She's, she's going to sort all this shit out and come out with a forty-page essay, the definitive statement on quilting. How to make an American quilt by Finn Dodd. <laughs> How to make an American quilt by Finn Dodd, and she's going to shut down America for several days as everyone reads it. Yeah, that would be sick. Can you imagine? I'd be so down. But anyway, everyone but just she goes. Out. Where where does where is this house? It's in California, Grass, California. Got it. Yeah. yeah, it's dude. gorgeous. It looks like the house in Practical Magic, which I know is not a real house, so it can't be the same house. But it's probably roughly the same area. It kind of it yeah. kind of gives the vibe of um, like La Jolla. Yeah, I think it's mm. Southern California, right? Because yeah. there's no seasons. They say that. Yeah, yeah. It gi- it gives tremendous vibes of like either an hour north of LA or an hour south of LA. Mm. Mm, so true. Yeah. Um, which also is conveniently within the production uh, map of L.A. filming. All right. Okay. <laughs> so just, uh, I think it is set. The book is set in Grass, California. That was mm-hmm. congruent when I read it, I'm, at least I'm, from what I remember. I'm looking um, up where Grass, California is. And not cute, I imagine. But I thought, I thought it was really interesting also in a movie about how little power women hold in relationships. So they've all outlasted their husbands to keep the house, mm-hmm. which is not often something that happens right like you don't always get to keep your property especially back then so yeah and very powerful i thought because all these women um, are landowners we first get introduced to finn's grandmother um hi dodd but her the wikipedia has her full name and how, how her name is hyacinth hyacinth, and she goes by hyacinth. Hi. hyacinth, hyacinth is a flower that's, that's cool that's cool that's her real name. Her sister's also named after a flower. It's like, um, it's gladiola. Yeah. Did I say that right? I, it's not a common flower. Hyacinth is a little more common, but yeah. gladiola Joe, uh, then it's glady Joe. Glady Joe and hi. Mm-hmm. This is the juice of the movie. Like <laughs> this is the juice of the movie. Did yeah. you see and that they each have a red and blue color palette? Yes. Yes. And she's I... not the only thing. Uh, it's high. Because all these ladies are getting oh, I baked. Wrote, I wrote yeah. down in big letters in my notes, uh, this is not a sober movie. <laughs> this is not a movie for sober people. They drink and smoke the whole time. Everybody has a glass of wine in their hand, which is kind of typical with crafting, I find. People yeah. often do it mm-hmm. while drinking. Uh, I mean, look at us. We're all drinking, well, not alcohol. Water, water, and, and whatever and is that. Baja mountain. Blast. <laughs> Uh, no bud could accurately describe that <laughs> feeling. I threw up a little bit in my mouth. Uh, I'm drinking another sip of water. It's uh, it's the beaver. It's like, I'm going to go to Taco Bell and get me a bar. Ah! <laughs> I like, <laughs> I don't know if we can continue. Like, <laughs> um, but no, they're, they're all drink. It's, it's like perfect. It's like summer camp vibes. It's yeah. like, it's, 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 this is very clearly establishes like the safe space for these women. Yeah where they can all come together during the summer and just be themselves around each other and like drink wine, smoke weed, um, and just like have a good time as they make this quilt. God, and it's I like their routine. It's their, it's their life. They're in this beautiful like seaside home in Southern California. Seaside? Question isn't mark? it, isn't it like on the sea? No. Isn't there a large so. body of water? No. no. There's a, there's a pond, there's a swimming hole, but that's not a big body of water. Okay. That's I, a swimming hole. Probably am, what I'll bet is like a quarry filled or something. That's to exactly that what I was thinking. It's like, there's oh a quarry God, filled. God, Stuart, get out of my head. I, no, I mean, from the flashback scene of where she goes swimming, I it's like, sw- oh, that's a quarry. I think you guys are right. I could have sworn it was. No, they go really swimming in a swimming pool. Water yeah. is common. They talk a lot about water, especially Gladie uh, Joe's very like connected to water in her story in that case then but it's in california then grass california is north of sacramento um approximately an hour west of reno this seems like it tracks it's like kind well, of I like tahoe there. it's yeah. like tahoe oh it's in tahoe tahoe okay. tahoe-esque tahoe-esque that feels like that tracks yeah that sounds right to yeah. me but yeah, we're introduced I love to. I want to go back to California. Hot, what if we all just went to California right now? Let's go hang out go in Nevada hang, with my mom hang. and then drive to California. It. Yeah, let's do it. Let's hang out, me and Lizzie. You mean Beth? Well, me and Beth. You don't know my mom. <laughs> you don't get a nickname with my mom. 
I've met your mom once. We're best friends. It's like the worst yo mama joke instead of like, yo mama is so fat. It's like, I'm best friends with your mom. Yeah. We have a chat. She follows <laughs> me on Facebook. We talk about you. We, we She's do. not happy with how you're doing. It's and, like, ah. and we do follow each other on Facebook. I am friends with your mom on Instagram. <laughs> you guys are so old. <laughs> Stuart still at least, Stuart hey, is older than me because he hey, at least hey, uses Facebook. Hey. I have not used Facebook in a while. I, I use Facebook for the marketplace once every four months. What do you get on Facebook Marketplace? Our fucking VHS player that we bought together. Oh, was that that was more than. If anybody's taking a shot every time Jeff and Stuart are married, <laughs> that's your cue. <laughs> I gotta have um, a button in here that's like do, uh, do, 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 I don't know. There's do, 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 do. gotta be something in here to like take a shot right now. So when when Ona yeah. and uh, Finn shows up to this this quilting group, mm-hmm. um, and just kind of we get the lay of the land of like who these women are. Yeah. And uh, like we mentioned, they are played by, I'm just going to read it off. Anne Bancroft as Gladie Joe, Ellen Burstyn as High, uh, Lewis Smith as Sophia, Jean Simmons as M. Um, is that Jean Simmons? That is Jean Simmons. Hot damn. Um, Kate Nelligan as Constance, and then Alfrey Woodard as Mariana. Oh, and finally, Maya Angelou as Anna Neal. Um. It's just kind of crazy that Maya Angelou is in this movie. Yeah. That really rocked my world. <laughs> I was just like, wait, that's just that's just Maya Angelou as herself. She did great, too. Yeah. She, I don't know if she's ever really acted aside from this. Because she, she's been in movies, but she's always just played. She plays herself, understandably. I'm looking up. She is um, She's the narrator of the Hall of Presidents. Interesting. Queen. Okay. Did not know that. Um... But yeah, it looks like aside from this, she's mostly only played a character in Poetic Justice, the John Singleton movie that's very good, uh, a few, an episode of Roots, and some TV movie called There Are No Children Here, which uh, has a child on the poster, so there clearly are children there. Um, so but, so they're liars. So, so it's a liar, liar movie? Okay. But it, it's just deeply fascinating to me um, what, like attracts someone like Maya Angelou and or what even inspires the director to cast Maya Angelou in this movie because she's such a she's a prolific you know member of the civil rights movement and poet in her own right um and it's just it's just fascinating to me that she's in it I think it makes sense for the character of Anne because she is described and portrayed as somebody who holds a profound amount of wisdom and is Mm -hmm. also the undisputed leader of the group Mm -hmm. uh so I think it would make sense to put some of your casting, like <laughs> your casting monopoly money that you only get to spend in certain places, yeah. like putting a hundred casting bucks towards getting Maya Angelou. This is such a weird metaphor, but you understand what I'm yeah, saying, yeah, right? Yeah, Where yeah. it's like, I, I have a limited amount of resources on what character do I put my resources? Anne's character needs to be someone who every word they say, even if it's calling somebody a whore in the street, rings through the room. Yeah. Also, I do want to say Maya Angela only narrated the Hall of Presidents during the Clinton administration. Uh, she was replaced by J.D. Hall for the Bush administration, then Morgan Freeman for the Obama administration, and then Joy Vandiver Cobb, who has done both the Trump and Biden administrations. Cool. I can't. I wonder if they're in a club. Like, I wonder if you <laughs> narrate the Hall of Presidents and then you are a subscriber to a magazine for the rest of your life. Probably. I feel like, yeah, you get Hall of Presidents. It goes out to all the presidents and then the narrator. You get a smoking so. jacket. Yeah, the number on the back. Mm-hmm. I also want to say this movie's two hours long. I didn't really feel it. No, it's it's no. well paced. It's well no. paced. Very well paced movie. Um, I think from this point on, and you guys can tell me if you feel any different. That to like describe this movie is kind of more like as this movie does itself is just go through. Yeah, each talk about of one at a time. Talk, talk. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a May thought it was going to be a series of short films. She was like, oh, it's just going to be like an anthology, basically. But I thought they were very well connected. But yeah, I mean, you dip into these little... It's almost... um, This is such a weird thought. It's almost like a Prezi, Mm -hmm. where you have seven circles, and then you just zoom in on each circle, and then zoom deeper, deeper, and then you do like the full pull back into it. Yeah, right. A nesting doll. Like a Russian nesting doll. Yeah, that's a much nicer Mm -hmm. way of saying Prezi. But yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, But we start with high and gladdy their Mm -hmm. stories are kind of like together they are right but i also like that everybody's story has a little bit of everybody else yeah so you get 
more information about people. Mm. Like, right. Gladdy Joe's and High's story made a lot more sense to me when I saw Gladdy Joe with Anne. Yeah. And it was like, oh, click, you know, yeah, right. another piece of the puzzle fits into place. But yes, you're right. Their stories were first. Yeah, their stories were first. And they're not and young. They're like mid-adult. Because the... Oh, for, for when their flashback starts. Their first flashback, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say. they have kids at that point. Like, I don't think Gladdy Joe had kids, but I know, High must have had kids because her husband died and... Finn Dodd exists. Yeah, the only mm. real difference in their flashback is their hair color, really. I thought the makeup in this movie was fantastic mm, and the casting yeah. for all the younger actors. I did well, I forgot to say that before. It's true. It was insane. I was looking for flaws and I couldn't find it. Yeah, and and but that that actually makes it very interesting to talk about that like their flashback moment aka because each flashback moment is again to use a, the word like lesson, which I don't even know if that's the best way to describe it. If each flashback is like a lesson it's interesting that the first one is a lesson that they went through not that long ago mm -hmm. no that this was a the flashback is very recent that is very it, their their story to tell about finn dodd's like transition in her life is something that they experienced not yeah. that long ago because it's, it's glad joe tells her story first yeah. Right about no, no. Hi, or is it hi, hi, oh, hi, hi telling the story? Yes. Because Gladdy Joe's Gladdy like, Joe. oh well, are you gonna tell her? And Hi's like, fine, I'll tell her. And yes. then she talks, and then Gladdy Joe finishes it. We actually don't yeah. see the transition. Right. It's yeah. them together. Because I think that makes sense. It's an interconnected yeah. story. Because Gladdy Joe has that last thing to add when she goes to the yeah. hospital, and she's eating ice cream yeah. at the end. Yeah. It's, it's after Hi's husband has died, or he's while on he, his deathbed. While he's on his deathbed. Uh, she has an affair with um, Gladdy Joe's husband. Well, to, played by Rip Torn. To be more mm -hmm. like descriptive about it, it's because she the way she describes it is like she was with her husband at their deathbed, and then through emotions of feelings of loss and isolation. The, wor the way the book describes it is that she wishes he'd pass soon. Right. And then mm -hmm. she's like overtaken by that. And it's like, I have to get out of here. And he drives her out so that she can head back. Um, and he's struck with how much she looks like her sister, whom he has not had a good relationship with. They, they like married, they were together. And then it was like, we're actually better off as friends, sleeping in different bedrooms, not having sex. Yes. And then that's when her and Rip uh, Torn do the Rip I did. Torn. I did write down, and this is an example of it. We're going to talk about it a hundred times. This movie is a great example of why you don't need sex scenes in a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there were no sex scenes, but this movie is entirely about sex. Yeah. And I never felt like it was gratuitous. I was never uncomfortable. I also never felt like the women were ever put in a position where they would be uncomfortable. Yeah. We'll talk later about like the most gratuitous sex scene. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But I was watching this and I was like, wow. So kind of just like another reason this movie would not have been made today is that every one of those sex scenes would have been gratuitous and bit. like yeah very like almost shock value -y. like i don't know if i would trust anybody else to take this movie right now and be mm -hmm. like game of thrones it you know yeah yeah, yeah. fuck them up fuck them literally up. fuck them up quite literally but anyway there's a very it's all innuendo but it's like deeply implied that they have an yeah. affair yeah there's I'm no so sorry there, you're well, you're the host no of the podcast no 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 there's no misunderstanding with the with the implied sex scenes. Well, especially you almost find out about it with Gladdy Joe, right? Where she yes. says something where she's like, Oh my God, I can't believe you two are hanging out without me. And then they both kind of freeze and she's like, Oh yeah. Oscar moment. You know, she's that was great. just so good. It was, was so just so good. good. Like her figuring it out. And just like, Oh, the it felt so primal mm -hmm. to just go and smell him. And he's like, what are you doing when he knows exactly what she's doing? Yeah. And then, I don't know. I I always see the thing where it's like we need more um, complex female characters. You guys couldn't handle Katara, <laughs> like Gladie Joe throwing things at her husband and br like looking for something she hasn't broken yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bruh, I've been there. We've yeah. all been there. Like yeah. I think if that were if somebody watched this with today's mindset, and I, I don't want to just like talk trash on today, but it's like, oh, that's. Um, manipulative and abuse to throw things at your husband it's like yeah maybe she was mad like it, yeah. there was a lot happening it was crazy yeah, nobody it, was it right and no one was it, wrong it doesn't make it right it just makes it real it makes it real and honest and that's why i love the line she says because like as she's like throwing all the stuff at her husband and like time and time again and he tries to like kind of 
poorly, I would add, like defend himself. Like, listen, honey, we haven't like been together in so long. And I just don't feel like we have had that connection in so long. And like, as she's like throwing more stuff and finding more things to throw. And then we cut back to present day and we see like that. She plastered all of the broken porcelain figures on the wall is like for every, like all of this is like symbol symbols of like how long and how much I've been mad at him. And when Ona's looking at this and she's like, Oh my God, like that's so much. Like, did you ever forgive him? And she says, well, yeah, honey, that's what you do when people die. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like, fuck, that was good. Look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We are having such a nice conversation right now. I feel bad doing bits, but I'm going to do a bit. Do a bit. Because let me tell you, when I found out that when her husband walked in the room and it was rip torn, I'm like, you tell me this guy is not going to cheat on you. (laughs) (laughs) Come on. Yeah. Stuart, do you know where this picture comes from? Is is it a um, a mugshot? It is his mugshot. Do you know why Rip Torn got arrested? Cheating on women? No. DUI? No. Sexual assault? Public intoxication. Ooh, that's a good one. Close. (laughs) Public Public urination? urination? No. Public Uh, intoxication is the reason that he did the thing. You're not going to guess it. Rode a motorcycle in a casino. That's not allowed anymore. Rip Torn got so fucking hammered and was trying to walk home and then broke into a bank thinking it was his home and that his keys weren't working and then fell asleep on the floor of the bank. Wow. It's the coolest thing anyone's ever done is break into a bank. That is it was the mugshot shot you take after <laughs> you, you're asleep soundly on what you think is your bed, but it's just the hard carpet floor of a bank <laughs> and a flashlight. Scrooge McDuck sleeping in the piles of money. <laughs> yeah. Like what? A fucking cop flashlight in your eyes. Like, sir. And you're like, oh, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> really How did I get in here? It's like, a, I was going to ask you the same the, thing. The, fucking like, bank. the amount of events that have to occur to break into a bank thinking it's your home just really does it for me. Like, what time of the night was it <laughs> that it's nobody like, saw him do this? Bad security at the bank. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, that's worrisome. Uh, it'd be um, even better if it was a Chase Bank. But anyway, I don't from, know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I could find out. Whoops. Bank of America. <laughs> Bank of America. Welcome to Capital One. This yeah. is the outline of where Rick Van Horn is asleep on the you floor. You know that's like a tour piece of the bank. <laughs> it's Because like, you know it's a bank in L.A. and they love whoa. showing it off. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, my God. We actually do have to figure this out, Jeff. What, what Which bank is it? It was called. It was the Litchfield Bank Corp building oh, in Salisbury, boring. Connecticut. Boo. So yeah, uh, hi. Had an affair with Gladys. Yes, husband. Mm-hmm. And then we, we then hear Gladys' side of the story right then, or do we get the other women in between? We, we get the other women in between. I remember and we come back to it happens. Yeah. I think at the same time because like. High high goes first. Gladdy ends it. It's the same story. Okay. I don't think it ever yeah. breaks off. That's okay. their that's their story together. And then we get to know more about them as kids and Anne's story, which comes much later. Okay. Yeah. So then Gladdy finishes by saying, "Oh yeah, and that wasn't all because then I went to the hospital, and mm-hmm. then she sees. Oh yeah, and I was gonna tell them. Yeah. And she sees them together, and she's like, "I'm just not gonna take them down with me. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna let him die thinking she was faithful. Good shit." Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that. being sisters with someone, which is yeah. I would protect you to the ends of the earth so that I could be the one to kick you in the shin. Yeah. How and, dare you steal my shirt? And the lesson with me forever. And the lesson Winona gets out of this seemingly is it's it's okay to have a little fling. Um, because it'll be forgiven. I do I, not know. I do that, not agree with uh, you less. No, I think that at the beginning, that's where she's going with what she's thinking. And then I, at the end, she gets it all recontextualized. I kind of feel like the, what I got from that, if anybody's curious, is her mom has had a series of boyfriends and then she finds out her grandmother was unfaithful. And it's kind of like, well, if it's already if it's already baked into my blood, right? Like yeah. if two of the women I care about have done it, is there any point in me stopping myself? Mm-hmm. And I mm. think um, I think it's an interesting thing to talk about infidelity where it's like being faithful to your partner is actually, I think, harder than people give it credit. Not because mm. it's like, obviously don't cheat on your partner. But I think making the choice every day to be faithful to somebody is not something that should be treated as easy or second nature. Mm. It's a choice you make. And yeah. thusly, it should be really respected. Being faithful is... You know, it's just like being good or hopeful or honest. Like it is a choice you make every day. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Because it's a lot more nuanced than just simple, like, physical adultery too yeah emotional affairs stuff like that yeah yeah things where it's like you know in 1995 it's like as long as you didn't kiss the person like there's no foul done back then whereas like you know now at least it's treated more respectfully in the sense of like yeah no like and men cheating would be more excused than a woman cheating. Absolutely. To a significantly higher degree. And mm-hmm. even then to this day when we're on the subject of emotional uh, infidelity, even I would say it's still kind of the same way here. Like how often do you see more times of like, you know, the in like a heteronormative uh, relationship couple, like the man being like, well, you can't DM other guys, but mm-hmm. I can DM other girls. Or you can't be scrolling on a guy's Instagram, but I can be scrolling on a girl's mm-hmm. Instagram. Like mm-hmm. these are modern like contexts that we're talking about, but it's all in the same like um just the more like as you said, Ange, like, you know, treating it like it's a choice you're making every day rather than a simple second nature thing. Yeah, because I think and we'll talk about it in a second, but Dean's story with uh his wife where he's cheating on her over and over again. Like if you if you make being faithful to your partner out to be something super easy. And it's like, oh, this is something super easy that I can't seem to figure out. I must be a failure, right? Like mm. there, it doesn't, it doesn't talk about like, this is something you learn. There are tools for it. You can remake the choice. You're not mm. doomed to the moment you fail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you set people up for failure when it's like this thing, that's something you learn and try at is actually really easy. And the fact that you can't do it makes you a bad person mm-hmm. and you should die. Right. Like that's, that doesn't encourage growth. Yeah. yeah, infidelity seems like such a black and white scenario to lots of people until you're in the middle of one. Yeah, which is what this movie is about. It's yeah. all shades of gray. Yeah, yeah. It's like not to not to throw in like like this isn't like my personal experience. Are you gonna but say you cheated on me? No. Well, <laughs> you're married, Jeff. I just mean like like I've I've seen and I, <laughs> I like I I've, I've seen like I've had friends who have been in relationships where they get cheated on and in my brain it's like well this is a black and white situation like they cheated you're out of the relationship mm-hmm. go be with somebody else who's better and the response is not that clear cut it's like no it's something that we need to work on yeah I still love them right I still love them we're still a couple this is just another obstacle like again not to oversimplify it but it's like you know, I'm, I'm the shoes in the house. She's a shoes off the house kind of person. And it's like, this is an obstacle that we just have to work through. And to hear it be talked about in, again, not the same quantitative way, but in a way of like, just like, you know, it's like, no, this should be like a clear cut, cut the cord moment that happened to you guys. And it's not It's disjarring for a lot of people. And I think that's why I think this movie and especially with Dean's storyline, um, has that nuance to it that you don't see. The, the next story we get is Sophia Darling, um, who's the diver. Yeah. Yes. I thought her husband was the hottest. There, I said it. <laughs> Preston. If we're, we're, we're going to do, do smash or pass on this, yeah. I thought Preston was cool. Dean's hotter, but I do. Th- yeah. I feel like I liked him the best. Dean, when he's, you know, an old, like, looks like a rattled Vietnam vet. Um, Hot. Sorry. What? <laughs> that wasn't me. He yeah. looks like when uh, Bill Hader did that, like, Vietnam puppet. That's what he looks like. Hmm. Hmm. Well, never mind. I take back what I said. <laughs> um, but no, we're we're introduced to her story because the um Gladdy Joe and High take uh Winona Finn to the pool and they're just all hanging out and Winona meets what's his name? The guy the uh, she, Do we know what his ethnicity is either? Because obviously it was like, oh my god, he's ethnic. But I don't I don't know if we ever clarified Leon. Leon, Leon. that's his name. Played by Jonathan Skage. Who is from Edgewood, Maryland? That's great. That does not tell me at all <laughs> um, what tra- what they were. He trying is Catholic. To- <laughs> I can say that. Okay, so <laughs> he frequently accompanied Ellen DeGeneres to public events because she had not yet come out as a lesbian. I've learned this. He married Christina Applegate, and then they got divorced. Nothing about where he's from. Um. He's an interesting character. He's not an advocate for sexual for sexual violence. He's he not was. an advocate for sexual violence. Uh, no, he's like an advocate against sexual violence. Oh, cool! I thought it was like he does not. He is not pro sexual violence, which is an interesting Would be a take. Wild thing to be. 
an advocate for sexual violence that we need more. He of just it. has tables on college campus. Sexual <laughs> violence is good. Change my mind. <laughs> Where's the button for bad joke? Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but we meet. Um, but like he starts making the moves on Finn. I uh, don't know if he does. I think you can talk to somebody in line. I, I thought it was interesting that he only really started making moves on her when she told him he, she was engaged. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you sure about that? And then yeah. starts like kind of reaching. I thought that was fascinating because I think you can talk to somebody in a line and be, f she was flustered. Mm -hmm. He was not. He was like, I'm training. What are you doing here? Like, I mean, his lines are like, my arms are so swole. Look, feel them. Like, that, that is was, not his line. That, that was, he's, he's like, I'm training. Was, I feel like I could fly. Like, I, I don't know. What I got from that is like, he's a, pardon me for saying, a very neutral, just kind of like, hot guy and the fact that that makes finn nervous when he's not really advancing in any way right like if if any shirtless sweaty guy stands behind you in line and asks you where you're from and you're like maybe i should cheat on my fiance mm -hmm. mm. you, you that's something you have to unpack in the safety of your own home like you're mm. holding a suitcase mm. not him you know mm. i i kind of felt like just on the filmmaking language of it, they were trying to imply like he was hitting on her, but perhaps like maybe that's just, I me could reading. be wrong also. I mean, I, I didn't take any notes on that section. I was more interested in Sophia Darling's story mm -hmm. because she, uh, with that context in mind, she like, she goes back and she's talking with Gladdy Joe and, um, hi. And they see Sophia just walking through the pool. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, you know, she used to be an extremely impressive diver. Well, yeah. they say she had a really nice figure. Yeah. First. Yeah. She used to be really beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting because Sophia's been set up until this point. It's like she made Finn cry when she was a kid. She's she the seemed angry like old harsh. Lady. Yeah. Um, she's my grandma. Yeah. She's, she's, she's also the one that says, um, are you going to have children? Are you using protection? Yeah. Which comes into play later. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And so then the, this is a great, like film transition because we see like somebody on the diving board and it transitions to it being, uh, Sophia on the diving board. Yeah. Is this the fifties? If it's her, right? I think if she, so. if you're 20 in the fifties, you're 70 in the nineties. In yeah. It feels kind of fifties esque. I think with like, I don't know. I didn't Probably. quite get sixties. So it might've been late fifties. I don't know if it matters. I, I think so. I don't know what car he's driving to like take her out on the date. That was kind uh, of yeah, my first oh, You know, my old Studebaker. Yeah. Nice. But um, no, she's at the pool and then she gets approached by Preston. Um, and he he's he's immediately like flirting with her. Oh, 100%. Because like what's the first line he says? Well, it's he's, like, he says uh, he helps her out of the pool and then he's like, what's your name? And she says, Sophia. And he's like. Sophia and she goes Sophia, Sophia darling. darling and he's like what and she's like like the my last name is darling and he was like oh I thought you were calling me mm. darling and she was like no sorry about that he's like I really like that when we get married you can keep it we'll break tradition yeah I'm not gonna hold it that's hot it's a good move all right Stuart did find a way to use sound effects on there this we go <laughs> gentlemen write that down uh, I mean I don't know if you could do that I don't know if you could do that today it was pretty smooth. It was pretty smooth. Kinda, it was pretty smooth. It, he, he really slid into that. Yeah. You got to give it to I feel him. like that's the, um, I don't know, the anime that does it where um, it's it's a girl writing a note for a guy and he's she's like struggling and he's like, are you having trouble? And she's like, it's hard. You have a complicated last name. He's like, well, that's a bummer. What are you going to do when it's yours? Mm. Oof. Look, Oof. sometimes you do got to give it to him. Matt 20. You hate to say it. Yeah, sometimes you got to give it to him. But you do have to give it to him. Well, then she responds likewise in a very similar quippy kind of way. Well, yeah, right? she kind of she kind of lets it slide, and then it's like he's like, "What do you want to do with your life?" And she's like, "I don't know, marrying Marry you, you, I guess." <laughs> yeah. And you can see he's like, <laughs> "It's working, it's working." <laughs> um, and then yeah, they they make plans to go on a date. Yes, he, uh, she gets in the car and is and he's like, "I had a dinner reservation for us," and she was like, "Nah, uh, private location, you and me." Yeah. Whoa crazy uh yeah and they're starting out going in the woods and it's a very like and I, I this film filmmaking wise it's like very like you know rom-com yeah. lovey-dovey and she she like sees him as an escape from her like 
kind of oppressive relationship with her mom. Right. Because before we, we, I kind of missed over that where it's like, she's at home. She, well, she's at home and she's like getting ready. And that's when her mom says the line. It's like, darling, you're, you're not pretty enough to be alone. Well, she says a few different things, which is like, he's a college guy. Don't talk. They love to talk. Yeah. Um, and she kind of implies like put out a little bit to keep him on the ropes. And she's like, Mm. mom, stop it. Like, that's not what I'm going to do. She's like, well, you know, you're too, you're not pretty enough to be alone. So you should probably take the first offer that comes your way is the implication. Yeah. Which again, I kind of feel like sets up Finn's conversation with Sam where it's like, this is the baggage that women bring into these conversations. Mm -hmm. It's like when you get in a car with a guy and the guy's like, I mean, I don't know the baggage that men bring to dates because I'm not a man, Mm -hmm. but I, I imagine it's not like, Oh, well, if this doesn't work, I'll have to be alone forever because I'm not pretty enough to live on my own. The, the, it's probably not that. When, when I go bad. on a date, the knowledge I bring in and the baggage I carry is being <laughs> the knowledge of knowing all the pod, ra- the pod race <laughs> uh, drivers' names. And I'm like, does she know who Rats Tyrell is? <laughs> this is the... Yeah, go ahead. I, Okay. It is the it is the thing where it's like, what is he thinking about? He's probably thinking about other girls and how to cheat on me. It's like, hold on. If they were pod racing and they took a right turn, how could they have taken a right turn again and not ended up in the crowd? Like mapping out pod yeah. racing in his head or something like that. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah. if it's like, I wonder what Betty's thinking about other girls. It's me thinking about um, a holy war spreading across the galaxy, a war in my name. <laughs> Endless legions yeah. worshiping at the shrine of my father's skull. I 100% know that when I'm lying in bed and it's like every every terrible thing I've ever done crashing over me and I look over, I'm like, oh, May's so peaceful. If only I like, if only I could be like her. She's so kind. Like, I want to be with her forever. And, and it's like a red day, a death day, <laughs> ere the sun <laughs> rises. A red sun rises. Blood has been spilt this night. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking about my, yeah. Yeah, May, May's thinking about the Silmarillion. I'm thinking about how I'm never going to make it in life. You're we thinking, are not you're the thinking, same. You're thinking about that day in third grade. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Her like, Baron and Luthien. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then they make it to the quarry. Mm-hmm. Or uh, I mean, it's never said it's a quarry. It's a, it's a watering hole, but my yeah. bet is it's some it, kind of, it's a, it's a lake in California. Yeah. They don't make those out there. And then. I wish we still had watering holes. Oh my God, I wish we still had water. <laughs> true honestly shame that went extinct check me check back with me in 15 years um as the earth gets hotter and we'll maybe be laughing at this it was 72 in chicago last week 72 in chicago tomorrow fuck i was telling my mom it's like it's really nice my kids won't live to see 50 but it's a really nice day (laughs) like yeah um she immediately goes swimming Mm -hmm. and in the way i interpreted like preston seeing this it's like he's attracted to her like fearlessness and just unwavering like confidence, I guess. Yeah. And also I think she's a little bit like not like other girls. Right? Yeah. Right. And so then he joins her there. They make out and he says like, you know, I want to be a geologist. I, I'm studying rocks. I want to go all over the world. And, and I want you to come with me because she's like, I want to be a diver. It's like, well, it's great. Cause I, where I think rocks are the most beautiful is where, you know, land and water come together yeah i don't i don't know if she says i want to be a diver it's his or, pitch to her right it's like you can swim down to the bottom of the quarries and you yeah. can get the rocks for me and we can work together yeah right it's it's pitched in this very like romanticized way and then it cuts to them in a house with a kid yeah according to the book that was when they got pregnant one time they had one, unprotected sex wow and that's not in the movie hmm it's never said well, but I, mean, it's, I, I felt like it was implied is it implied? Yeah, I because like the the because in her telling, they basically they they have unprotected sex, they get married, and then they have a kid. Like the the next flash forward. I think it, the implication is a little. It's not as obvious because they were talking about getting married going on yeah. that date, right? So it's not that much of a shock. Mm-hmm. But I think they probably weren't planning on having. I know in the book, it's like they have sex on their first date, and then they have a kid. Yeah, it's because of that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pull a Jeff Sweeney and read a uh, excerpt of the Wikipedia here under Sophia Darling story. Yes. Uh, it says, uh, I want to also just shout out whoever formatted this Wikipedia. Yeah, they, did uh, you, a they job. really put the work into it. However, motherhood turns out to be just as, if not more oppressive and married life soon grinds her down with three children and little help from Preston. who is frequently away because of his job. She no longer has time to dive and eventually forgets the feeling of freedom and escape. It gives her. He, she puts in his head that he's going to leave her too, which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think that's another, um, sorry. 
another hit I think about the baggage you bring and the way you influence other people. Yeah. Where it's like, you're going to leave me because you get to leave and I don't. And he's like, why would I want to leave you? And she's like, you're just gonna. And then it's like, well, if, the, if I was always going to. Mm. Right. Yeah. No. Now, as you say that, Ange, that adds another layer that I. Kind yeah. Of I, don't, like I, I don't think any of the men in this movie are like, oh, you, you left me because you just didn't like me. Or like you left me with, because you were selfish. So mm-hmm. when he left and he took her picture with him. So it was kind of more like he was just doing it like a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of way. A little bit, but I think also in a sense of like, you know, you have your three kids and I, I don't know if this gets implied if the kids are, I think it's after the kids have grown, right? Cause the watering mm-hmm. hole is there, Yeah. but like maybe the kids have moved out at this point. I don't know what the book says. Um, but he leaves with her photo and he never comes back. But I've also kind of feel like they didn't make each other happy, right? Like he tried a few times to be like, I know I've he kind of like, this has not worked out the way you wanted it to. Yeah. Maybe I can help a little bit. Uh, I think I've talked to both of you about this. It's called like an emotional bid Yeah. Mm-hmm. where you offer up like basically are vulnerable for a second to share something. Yeah. And if you're in a relationship, the science is like, you have to say yes, 75% of the time for it to work. Hmm. Otherwise, if you shut your person down anywhere under 75%, you're going to kill the relationship. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I missed where he like dug out a small hole. Yeah. He digs out that pond and he's filling it with his son when they get back from the grocery store. And that's when she has a conversation with their daughter where she's like, I want to go to college. And she's like, no, it makes more sense for the boy to go. Cause then you can just get married. And she's like, but I want to go to college. And she's like, well, we don't all get what we want, do we? Mm. And there's some weight to that line. Yeah. And then she's like, what the fuck are you doing at my yard? And her husband's like, I wanted to make you a pond. It's not deep enough to dive, but I Mm. thought it could be a little water here for you. You could wade in, keep goldfish in it. And then later he's like, maybe we put goldfish in the pond. Like he says it again. Yeah. And she's like, are you leaving? Like it, she ignores it entirely. And this isn't to say like, oh, it's her fault. Her husband left. Right. Like, right. No, but but I I do think it's like, that's what, that's what, what that was. It's an emotional bid because he loves her that didn't get responded. So then he just kind of took the next step that she subconsciously almost not wanted him to take, but I don't know, sort of. Yeah, I think self-fulfilling prophecy. I yeah. think I also think men have the freedom to leave, right? She couldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Men can leave and not reap the consequences. Yeah. Women have to be left with the consequences. Yeah, if she that. left, where would she go? Yeah. I will say she got to her house. Again, like that's a woman who outlasted her husband in some way and got to own her own property. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which was unheard of back then and it was uncommon. Yeah. Assuredly. Kind of sad. What's the lesson in this one? If there is one, there may not be a lesson. Again, I don't know if there's a lesson in any, like, not in the Seinfeld way that there are no lessons, mm-hmm. but I don't know if we learned anything from this other than it's tough. It's tough out there. I'm finding it really, like, incredible to listen to you speak during this episode, Ange. So, Me? Yes. I was say, That's this why I'm is being kind this, of, I'm kind of being quiet because you're just kind of killing it over there. I would there. say, th- this is the best possible, like, movie to have you on. <laughs> I really, I didn't mean to pick this movie. I'm so, so glad I did. Yes. You're, you're yeah. like, revealing this movie to me as you speak. I, I, and honestly, all I can be like, is like rip, pull, and broken through a bank. <laughs> am I right? Like, in the well, no, to, like, be real, like, Sophia Darling's story, how it ends, I thought to that, oh, so he, he he was a piece of shit and left. Like, I didn't really get all the, the cues of, like, no, the, the emotional bidding was... That was good. That was good. I, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't register that. And now, as you said it, it's like, oh, yeah. Like, no, he has, like, think... multiple attempts. And even the Wikipedia says something kind of similar to that, where it's like one day she snaps at Preston for digging a pond in the backyard, trying to remind her of the girl he fell in love with. He tells her the pond is for her to wade in. After she rejects his effort, he realizes her free spirit is gone. So, yeah. yeah. But also, like, he took it, you know, it's. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess. To, what is it? Um, and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep saying really depressing quotes, but it's like men like to catch butterflies and pin them down. Mm-hmm. So you don't like it because it flew. You liked it because it was pretty. Yeah. Mm. I don't have a button for that. <laughs> I don't, it's mm. like, what's the button for like sad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just not good sad. That's like, uh, I don't know. 
It's just, but yeah, oh, I God. mean, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that like Preston's a good guy, Preston's a bad guy. There's too much nuance in this movie for that. But I do kind of feel like if you see a butterfly flying and you go, oh, how pretty it flies. Let me keep it for myself. And you pin it. And then you go, hmm, this one doesn't fly anymore. Yeah. It's your own doing. It's kind of your own doing. Mm -hmm. But I'll, like. Fuck. Also, she's not a butterfly. She's a person, right? There's more to it. Stuart's thinking about his butterfly collection in the other room. He's like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, Stuart's sweating. Like, I haven't shown Ange my bedroom, right? Because it's full of pinned bugs. Taxidermied. Uh, Taxidermied bugs. Um, so the next, because that's the end of her story until the very end of the movie. It is, yeah. Where she, um, we'll, we'll, we'll loop back and we'll just summarize all the, the end of the story yeah. at the end. Um, yeah, so we get her bit. We go back to the house. I believe she has the longest story. I think Sophia's is the, no, feels like the Anne's longest. Was Anne's was forever. Anne? Anne took Anne's was forever in a good way. Hearts to Anne. Loved that story. Yeah. But it was three stories in one. Because uh, it's M who I think is... Well, even M's is still pretty long. The uh, shortest one is Anne's daughter. Constance yes. and Mariana are borderline like... Constance's I thought two was minutes super long. cool. But it, it was short. Because uh, M is next. Yes. Yes. And that has the most gratuitous sex scene. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. had that actress must have not signed the same protection waiver as everybody else, a la Sex in the City, because she was nude. Mm -hmm. PG-13 movie, a lot of nudity. PG-13. But I thought, I don't know if you saw, because this is what I look for when I'm watching a scene like that, where um, Dean goes over to kiss her and she's fully naked. She's covered the entire time by his arms and legs. Mm -hmm. Everything is perfectly placed to protect her. And I was like, okay, intimacy coordinator. I see you. I see you working. Anyway. Yeah. Big sad. What? 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 What, what button? Just making me press a button. <laughs> what, what? Why? Why? Yeah, no, no. Just, okay. <laughs> Stop. Stop pressing the buttons. Okay. It's my yeah. fucking board. Um, I think it's our board. It we are, we did thing. split the cost of it. Yeah, we um, did split the cost of it. It's like joint custody. Joint custody. Everything oh in this podcast. Take a shot, team. Take a shot. In this, in this podcast is joint custody. Including me. Including yeah, Ange. We, we, uh, we get 50-50 Ange in the divorce. Our apartments are joint custody. Yeah. And, and whenever, tells you what might happen when the divorce happens. I was going to say, whoever's taking shots right now, stop. It's not safe. Like, <laughs> Dibs on May as be my lawyer for the divorce. That's fair. You're going to win. Um, you hire somebody else hires May's dad. Oh fuck! <laughs> be awesome. Anyway, that's a movie. Uh, they get back from swimming and they go to the house and Sam surprises them. That's when that happens, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because it's like been three weeks. Yeah. She's like, I can't believe you. Three weeks. Rightfully so. Yeah. She's kind of onto something there. Yeah. It's just like I I asked for three months and you couldn't last three weeks. I will also say it's the '90s, so there's no other way to talk over plans true you can't like send a text or an email i mean you can call surely yeah she doesn't phone. have a computer mm. she doesn't trust him you well, can't you can't they'll they're taking there you know well because she said they lose things and then implication of the movie i thought this movie was very well uh connected everything was a hint Yes. Yeah. Had me with my conspiracy board and my red string for You're real. Connecting for real. all of the the dots. Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. About yeah. why these why these women are the way that they are. Yeah, but she has her conversation with Sam, and I, I think I've talked that to its grave. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think it's just you get to like right after that story with Sophia Darling, and then it's like, oh, and then maybe this is the kids' room, and it's like, what are you trying to do to me? And yeah. he just doesn't have that context. Right. Yeah. I don't think Sam's a bad guy, especially I think I think this movie talks a lot about creating things. And I think being a carpenter is similar to being a quilter, right? He's tearing their house apart to build a life together. And then she's like, I don't care what you do. Right. No mm. emotional bid failure there. Right. I've driven out all this way to check with you to make sure that this incredibly labor intensive thing I'm doing fits you as well. And you toss it back in my face. That's good. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think when you make something with your hands hmm. and you give it to somebody, that's kind of, I don't know if either of you know the sweater curse, hmm. which is if you're dating somebody and you knit them a sweater, you'll break up before the sweater is finished because it takes so long to make sweaters and it doesn't, um, it's also just kind of like a curse, but also, 
you make the sweater, you finish it, you give it to them. They're never going to understand and appreciate how much you did. Yeah. How much mm. work went, into how it. much work went into it, the design, the buying, right? It's buying the yarn for a sweater is $200. Yeah. yeah. So it's a $200 sweater. It's hundreds of hours and you, it's very hard to take care of because it's handmade. Like yeah. I just feel that a little bit in carpentry also, right? Where it's like, I'm making you, it's like, what do you want? Custom bookshelves, right? Like mm. that's yeah. 30 more hours for me. Yes. That's a week's worth of work for me. Yeah. For you, and you don't even want it because I've already messed something up that I didn't know walking into yeah. this conversation. A failure of communication. Yeah. Fuck. Failure all around. What do we... Is Ange, it? I'm just going to put Jeff and I's dials down and just <laughs> you can just no. keep going. No, no, I'm so sorry. Just, no, uh, no, no, yeah, no, 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 don't, no, no. Don't fucking apologize. <laughs> I'm trying to think, when, when does she call him over and over again? Is that right after or do we get another story? I think we get another I think story. We get M story. Because we get M story. Oh, we get M story. Yeah. Which is Dean. Which is Dean. Um, I haven't even looked at my notes. They're both hot. Also, I again, it's important to me that people know those actors were hot. Yes. Look, no one's going to die. A lot of hot people in this movie. Yeah. yeah. You hate to say it. Jared I also Leto's think, I also think it was really movie. funny when it was like before Finn knows the story at the very beginning of the movie where she's like, M's married to an artist and that makes everybody really sorry for her. And it's like, oh man, I get it. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Oh my oh, God. Yeah. Artist. Am I right? Blah. And then, uh, we find out that he suffers from infidelity, like mm. truly is unable to keep it together. And then it's yeah. like, oh, that's not being an artist, but you call it that for a man. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. But anyway, I mean, their story is very interesting. He's like a very passionate artist. Uh, he and that's paints she, her over and over again. We see uh, it. The first scene is him painting her naked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And. Paint me like one of your that, This is when Jack. Angelica, uh, my partner who was sitting in the couch with me, like she was on crateandbarrel.com looking up like things to buy for the apartment. And mm-hmm. she looked up like, ah, oh, like Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> I almost wonder if it was the same couch because everything's in the same warehouse. Probably it might. It, it was honestly, a gorgeous. Wait, was a, yeah. hold on. Because I, on. if I was the furniture designer, or if I was doing the furniture for that, I and I had a little bit of money and a little bit of time, I would say. Uh, Jeff, come on. And welcome back to soothing sounds with Ange and Jeff. We're gonna take a moment to contemplate. I'm, I'm trying okay, to get I'm, Jeff into the habit I'm of sorry, connecting maybe, to the Bluetooth of the I'm board. I'm sorry. Maybe the best Just, thing James Cameron ever directed. Um, can, is your phone connected to the Bluetooth of the board? No, Just it clearly isn't. Well, can you do it right now? No, because I'm not playing the song again. The bit's over. Take a shot, team. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying really hard here. I'm trying real hard. Uh, sure. I'm not going to look it up, but I honestly like thinking about it. Titanic was 90, 99. 99. Oh. Because, so Actually, what, 98 going into nine. I can't, oh, so I can't it would have been well, I, that's, why, that's, why, that's interesting. All right. What do you do? Watch, you, I connect to the board. It says connected and then watch. Oh, it's probably because I'm connected on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So get your shit together. Well, we just have to make, sip, We just have people, to decide. We have a long podcast. We Take just, a sip, not we a shot. We have to decide, like, because sometimes I play some stuff. All right, it's disconnected. Try now. Okay, I'm trying again. I'm not pausing the recording. This is going to be litigated on air. Well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to drink some water. You should drink some water. Does anyone want to We'll refill? get back to M's story moment. Does anyone want to refill? I think I'm doing okay. Thank you, though. There. Yeah, see? See, look how much better quality that is for our audience. And welcome back to Better Quality Sounds yeah. and Jeff and Stewart. Feel at peace knowing your partner's probably not cheating on you. Except maybe they are if they saw the 1995 film, How to Make an American Quilt. Or the 1999 movie, Titanic. Welcome back to Titanic Sounds. The ice water is shifting around your body. You will be dead in hours. Peace. Tranquility. Peace. James Cameron. <laughs> See, this is why Jeff and I just, just like dial, put our dials down, and just let you go. I like that. Let, you, let you run with it. Uh, he's painting her naked, and then he. How would you describe this bit other than he gets? I've given him too much power. I was gonna say you made the worst decision connecting him to the Bluetooth. Uh, See, here's the thing: it's either this. Or he does the fucking phone to the microphone <laughs> bit, and it aggravates me. I yeah, I like that you can't stop him, but you could at least up the quality of the sound. Right, <laughs> that's our relationship. Yeah, <laughs> he has these dumbest fucking bits, but the least I could do is make it 
I don't know, worthwhile. All right, so he's painting her naked, and then the only way I can describe it in my male brain is he uh, he gets hit with the Cupid arrow strips and then has sex with her. Yes, on the couch. Yeah. Well, she's also. Oh yeah, like yeah. she's into I it mean, too. I'm not, I mean, I, I support women's rights and their wrongs, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. She's sitting. She's posing for him on the couch, and she kind of collapses, and you can tell like she's bored, and she's like, "Well, yeah." Mm-hmm. Um, but they, a lot of things going on here. They get married, and then he keeps cheating on her. He cheats on her originally with students. I yes. think he teaches art at a college. Students. Uh, yeah. Um, I love that it repeats the same music when he's in his studio and she's talking to... Uh, is it is it Sophia Darling who she's talking to? It is, right? I think... I Maybe? Because I, I think they all know. live in the same town, right? I know it definitely connects all the, the women together. I think it's Sophia Darling is sitting with her. Yeah. And she's like, what's he doing in his studio? And she's like, do you like do you want to say something? And she's like, nothing. Like, the implication is that these women have all known that he's doing this for a long time, which is not what's happening in the book, which is just an interesting, interesting. difference, right? Yeah. Because in the book, no one knows. And she's having these outbursts over and over again, and nobody knows why. I like I like that the movie makes it known. Well, more. also, for nothing else, that Gladdy joke and yell from the window, what are you doing, Dean? He's like, I'm just talking. She's like, just yeah. talking. Yeah. That's yeah. so small town. Yeah. yeah. And also the hairdresser totally knowing who he is and not giving a fuck. Ugh, that is. Yeah. I like, slap that shit right there. I like there. that That's choice accurate. in the movie that it makes him more widely known than it would be in the in in the book. Yeah, I think it's also fair that like there's he he doesn't really feel shame about it at this point. Yeah. He's older. He did when he was younger. There's some uh, like. Right. Yeah. So. And really, so what we, we've already pretty much described like half of the flashback story. The other half is that she leaves him. She tries to leave him. She gets pregnant. She goes to her parents' house, which is two streets down. And he takes her three mo- it takes him three months to find her, which can be taken two ways. He wasn't looking or he doesn't know how to look. Mm hmm. More likely the former, yeah. probably. I think that's a fair bet. But I also yeah. think that like given the way he was like, you can't leave me, you can't leave me, you can't leave me. I also imagine he was like racked with guilt flopping around the house. Yeah. yeah. Like I think kind of waiting for her to come back. But also like I, I he seems like a self-flagellating kind of guy. Yeah. I don't think while she was gone, he cheated on her because yeah. it, hmm. it doesn't make sense to his character for me. Hmm. He does eventually find her and her. Her parents help, um, like her coordinate parents with pack him. the car when yeah. she's that, not looking. That's like the the key, like heartbreak moment of this flashback is when she's like, "What makes you think I'm going? Go, I'm want to go back with you?" And then it just she looks over, cut to the parents packing the the trunk of the car. Yeah, I don't like, know if oh. it's covered at all anywhere, but I wonder if her parents called him. That's what I thought. That honestly, like that's kind of where my brain went right away. It's like maybe it's not that he wasn't looking that long, or uh, maybe that I guess that's so true that he just, he was just like, I'll let her blow off some steam. She's right, you know, I'm a terrible person. And then the parents and then call. the parents call. I I bet two months in they're like, come get her. He's like, no, she has a right. And then it's like no she's pregnant her. with your child. Well, she's nine months pregnant at that point. So I think right. she left six months pregnant. Yeah. So yeah, that's that, I could see that very much being like, yo, you know, you knocked up my daughter. You're married. It's 1950 something. Get mm-hmm. your ass over here and pick her oh, up. Oh, I like, thought the implication was that they wanted her gone, that they didn't care both. who Dean was. My mind says both. Yeah. That it's like, I just think I've never been, I've never had to take care of a pregnant person, but like I know the last three months are really tough and mm-hmm. you need a lot of help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really tough. It's a, it, it's none of these scenes are easy, which yeah. I think is a really interesting movie. Yeah. It, it was so well done cinematically for me. Cause it's just like when it cuts to them, like packing the, tr- the trunk and then it cuts back to her, just like getting in the front seat, almost like defeated. I'm yeah. like, this is what my life is going to be. And it's be. such the the tone for each of these is so different. Like this melodrama, yeah. like where they're both kind of yelling and screaming kind of soap opera E that when she gets in the car, there's no tears. There's no yelling. Yeah. Just defeat. Yeah. Ugh crushed me big bummer this is the juice of the movie yeah. this is the juice of the movie and so then like i, I that's I, when I don't... we so so we get this scene before she calls sam yes, yes. she tries to call sam over and over no answer so for... so you two are 90s boys so you can explain this to me oh, boy. she's leaving the message and yeah. she's like i know you think i'm terrible and then we hear a click that's someone picking up the phone and putting it down right to cut off the message 
Uh, for like an old landline, possibly, yes. Would it have just cut out randomly otherwise? So I thought if you call a landline to another landline that has a voicemail machine connected mm-hmm. to it, like it just projects to the house, right? Yes. And so like if you 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 would hear the voicemail be like projected from the speaker. Yeah, and that's why it's so like, are you there? Are you there? And then it I cuts to not. the other side of the phone call and you see the person standing over the voicemail machine listening to the the voice message being recorded. Mm-hmm. And so all they would have to do in this theoretical movie scene it would just like click click and you'd hear that would what it would sound like over there. Yeah, but on on Finn's side that happened. The reason I'm asking this is that when he said, like, I'm just I'm just going to finish this out so that people know what I'm talking yeah. about. She calls him a few times. He doesn't pick up. She calls once. She's not looking at the phone when she dials. She dials and picks up and a woman's voice picks up and goes, hello, who is it? Who is this? Mm. And she hangs up and she doesn't sleep. And then in the morning, she ends up getting a hold of him, getting the story. And it's like he stayed at his brother's because there was no plumbing. And I dialed the wrong number to get the woman's voice. But I don't think he stayed at his brother's because... He clicked the landline to not hear the rest of her message. Jeff. I was born in 97. I don't know. Why. My and my parents got a wireless one pretty quick. What did you think of the scene, though? I'm interested in knowing, like, because I just heard yours. I don't know. That's my thing. I don't know. But, like. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, I'm thinking maybe he was fooling around and maybe we got to, you know. It just changes yeah. a, a lot for me because I think in this movie Sam is a scumbag kind of already. I think Sam's just kind of boring. That's my problem with Sam is that Sam's boring. I wrote him that he's a jamoke. He's un- he's an uninteresting character played kind of boringly by a boring actor. I hear that. My my issues with Sam are less like necessarily his actions and more that the movie doesn't really make give me any reason to like care about Sam. Yeah, I understand that. Besides just that. as an object We're of like... We're also not seeing him at his best, right? Yeah. Like, we do not get a ton of him. Like, the, the Winona storyline is just such, like, a the 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 least interesting part of this movie. I almost just don't give a shit about Sam. That's where I'm at, too. Yeah. We just got done talking about M's horrifically tragic flashback. So when it cuts back to Winona, I'm like, like I just don't care. I don't yeah. really care that much. So that's why, like, I does it, I haven't, I'm not clicking on a lot yeah. of these points because I'm just, I'm not really checked in during those moments, yeah. those scenes. Which I think you're probably the same way, Jeff. Yes. Yeah. I was just like, get me to the next flashback, and then we go to Constance, and it's like three minutes long, and I was like, what? It would be worth watching when she picks up the phone to dial because I remember noticing very specifically that she doesn't look at the phone while she's dialing. Yeah. Mm. And then she the, knows a, the number. And then it's a woman's voice. But I also remember very specifically the click when she's leaving the message as if somebody's picking up the phone and putting it back down. So she couldn't keep talking. Yeah. Mm. That the story doesn't quite line up, but it's pretty believable, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like not, almost there. Yeah. It's not enough to condemn, but it's not enough to forgive. Yeah. Like, Something doesn't make sense, but it also without condoning or crude- without condoning or condemning, I understand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Doctor Manhattan line. All right. Okay. But anyway, so we get that bit. I'm a little lost where we are at this point because I know. I am too. We are on to Constance. Okay, thank you. I will say we should probably speed up slightly because we are running into our uh, upcoming plans. Oh my God, you're so right. Okay. Yeah. I'm locked um, in. <laughs> call, call me we, a we padlock are, we are the going way into the in. two shortest stories okay sick um it's constance mm-hmm. um who's played by kate nelligan mm-hmm. um constance's story is that oh god i lost it she had a very oh, no, yeah, yeah, very short. Her, her, she she marries the love of her life yeah. a traveling salesman they travel a lot they don't have kids yeah. this works for constance he dies this young. is this is book stuff now but they retire together basically he's done and he moves in with like they're living together for the first time and she's kind of annoyed that he's there because they're not used to it then she's like she kind of clicks into it and starts to live with him and he then dies yeah and so she's never really had like a long-term living together relationship with him even though they've been married yeah. and they and had she, yeah sorry they had had a dog together they had a dog whom she loved um who passed away before the husband yes leaving her alone Yes, and she loved him immensely and is grieving very hard. Dean, uh, M's husband, starts making the moves on her, and she says pretty consistently, I'm not going to have an affair with you. And it's not said in the movie, but it is said in the book, they do not have an affair. Mm -hmm. They hang out and they talk about the East Coast. The worst thing they do is that he wears her husband's blazer and she dances with him. But I think Mm -hmm. that's 
hundred percent on Dean. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a grieving widow. We'll leave that woman alone. But yeah. Everybody but, thinks they're having an affair because Dean is a consistent womanizer, uh, and they're not. A hound dog. Yeah. yeah. The the thing that's really interesting to me about this is for the most part, like we get these women's stories. And it's not really until the end of the movie that their their panel on the quilt is revealed. Mm-hmm. The art. Constance is is shown right away. I remember we cut back and it is like the, ye- the yellow, yellow flowers. Yellow bush. Yeah, where it's the, the, dog the first, it's the first time I caught where it was like, oh my God, it's her husband's shirt that she's using. Yes. No wonder she doesn't want to change it. Because like for the rest of them, they kind of leave it to the end to reveal what their what their panel of the quilt looks like, mm-hmm. what love means to them. Except for her where like we get it right away, which I just thought which is probably just foreshadowing to try and like put us in that mindset for the well, end. Also because her, her version of it doesn't fit with everybody else's. Yeah. And that's really clear where it's like, you have to change it. And she's like, no, I'm just going to take it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. But yeah, uh, I think the, the my favorite thing about that bit that I would want to talk about is that when D- she's like, Dean, are you trying to have an affair with me? And he's like, I am. And she says, well, if my husband was still alive, I'd be interested. And he's like, why, why would that, that doesn't make any sense to me. She's like, cause then I would have him to go home to when I came to my senses, mm. which is like, knife <sighs> under the rib up to the throat uh, like yeah. so incredibly i just filed that away in like my writer brain mm-hmm. it's like ooh, yeah sharp but yeah sorry that fantastic line what happens after constance's story constance's story i think we get mariana's alfrey woodard story and real just a quick little interlude because while i do think it's boring it it is it, it, part of the plot of the movie is when it does start an affair with leon Yes. Is that at that time, though? Because it's right, right after she gets Anne's story. You're right. It's after Anne's story. Oh, I've story. been waiting to talk about that. Yes. Don't worry. Okay. I, I'm locked in on yeah. that timeline. So then it is Anne's story first. Is it yeah. Anne before Mar- uh, Before Alfred the Woodard? Le- you know better because you have the thing pulled up. But I, think I, it is Anne, that- I think it is Anne's story. Anna. Yeah. Anne's story is a three-parter because it's her aunt's story, which establishes yeah. the crow as leading to... The place where you're supposed to go which yeah. is it leads her aunt to her husband she gets the quilt she falls in love or has fallen in love with a white um like she works for a family with her aunt and that family is a son who is jared leto and he loves her yeah. and they uh, end up together very briefly she gets pregnant so you've been waiting to Aunt, talk about yeah. jared leto anna played by maya angelo um, acclaimed beloved civil rights leader, mm-hmm. um, poet, mm-hmm. you know, presidential medal of freedom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very rarely acts. Uh huh. For sure. In this movie, mm-hmm. she mentions that she had a child. Um, to she was going to say she had a child and out of wedlock to Winona before mm-hmm. the story begins. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hmm, wonder who uh, knocked up Maya Angelou. And let me tell you, when that camera turned around. And Jared Leto is sitting at that table. He doesn't have I sex with Maya Angelou. He has sex with a young Maya Angelou. I screamed. I did I sit there? Texted my wife and said, "Come out to the living room right now." Made her walk out. I rewound the scene and made her watch it. Oh my god! I was sitting there. I was like, "That kind of looks like Jared Leto." That's crazy. First oh, hold movie. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Is it really? It's his first movie. Wow. Yeah. My angel getting railed by Morbius. <laughs> oh like, what's going God. on here? <laughs> oh my gosh. This can't this can't be what this podcast is about. <sighs> yeah. Um I thought that was really interesting where he's like, Have you ever been with a boy before? No. Are you scared? Why should I be? Oof. I know. Oof. And then it's like, well, what you should be scared of is being sent away. And then wait, she wait. basically steals the quilt, which was I don't, I don't know if I have time to get into yeah. all of like the little minutia of that scene. It's so cool. It's so cool. Jer- all Jared Leto says, the only reason you'd ever want to be scared of a boy is because uh, maybe in the future they'll buy an island and invite hundreds of women and then make them just worship you and uh, be your essential sex slaves for several months out of the year. But he's like, I don't know who would do that. Okay, so Anna's story finishes out. She's assigned to Hyacinth and Gladie Joe's house and then kind of grows up with them. And she and Gladie Joe become really close. Yeah. Which I thought was a very fun scene where Gladie Joe goes to her. She's pregnant, right? They're having a party and she goes to her and she's like i found this book for you right like i want to i obviously want to engage with you and she's like i don't really want to engage with you and she's like okay i'll wait yeah and she ends up teaching her how to quilt making the quilt for this baby um 
she has the baby she keeps it and that baby ends up being and i don't remember her name but it's her daughter who's in the quilting bee yes thank you jeff the most normal thing Uh uh-huh uh-huh picture of jared leto uh it's right after Anne's conversation where she shows her this quilt from her aunt which is old like um the story of it is like right after slavery ended where Mm her um I think her great aunt is the one that was free and found her husband, right? Or is it? I think so. Yeah. Is it one generation up? I don't know. I think it's two, two generations up if I'm not mistaken. Um, biggest thing that I remembered in Anne's story was when she does give birth to, um, um, Mar- Marianne, Mariana, 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 uh, Mariana. Mariana uh, thank you. That, what because i guess was it ever a question that she was going to give mariana away it was it, it must have been implied because i missed it where it was like some women at the ch- i think it was like she's gonna go and live somewhere assigned by the church mm-hmm. and she's gonna work there and then the baby will get adopted yes i didn't catch that but that might have been me and then the implication is when she has the baby it's like some women at the church are going to come and she's like i'm keeping my baby and that yeah. was the first time i heard it and i was yeah. like i didn't even know that was off the table that's, yeah. that was that's crazy that was where my head was at too is when i heard that line after she gave birth already it's like oh like she i was think gonna... there's some cultural stuff that you and i just don't know about yeah. back then right. <laughs> how how, how black women were shipped around to different churches. Like Oof. I, I just don't think you and I are aware of that, which is amazing that we don't have to be, but yeah. Um, yeah. And then I think that kind of, like I said, like you, you guys both said that it introduces more into how Anne is getting in with Gladdy Joe and, um, hi. And then that story ends right after she gives birth to Mariana. Yes. And that's where we get Winona starting an affair with Leon. Yes. yes. And like the, she's supposed to meet him and she waits, meets him later because she's going to, uh, she there, I think they were going to go see a movie. Yeah. And then she waits cause she wants to see the quilts that Anne doesn't always bring out. It's a special yeah. occasion. And then she goes out and finds him and they immediately start having sex. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he shows up at the door and I remember high and Gladys Joe do the, like the Disney channel style. Like, yeah, peeking around the around the door, and there, my interpretation of that was almost like, oh, this is the mistake she has to make, kinda. Yeah, it's like they're all kind of seen. It's like that's not Sam, but like she has to make this mistake to learn from it. Yeah, I mean, I also think, what are you, these women gonna say, right? Yeah, like, what, like, what are is what that are, your husband? Gladdy Joe could maybe say something. Yeah, but Hyacinth certainly, like, you don't have the grounds. Yeah, which is, I think, you know. If your grandmother and your mother both have histories of infidelity, who's going to tell you to stop? Yeah. Right. No yeah. one. Is it around the same time I think um her mo- Finn's mom shows up? Is that the next day? It, I think it's it is the like next the day. next day after she had an affair cuz that's it, where the whole dialogue scene kind of brings up being like you told me that marriage was a sham or whatever. Yeah. Well, cuz like, I think I think what happens right after is she goes to Mariana to hang out with her and she's like, "I did all this research like Oh, yes. Yeah, monogamy is useless and it doesn't make sense. She's like, are you talking to your fiance about this? And she's like, what? Well, and Mariana's had this history of like, she's like, I was never tied down by a man. I never wanted to be tied down. I was really happy to have all of these different lovers. And it's the question of if you had a choice between a friend and a lover, who would you marry? And she said, I'd marry my soulmate, Soulmate. which Mm -hmm. is a man that I met once who I don't know his name, who was so kind to me. And I felt an immediate connection and he was married. Yeah. It, it It cuts to like... We cut to Paris. I'm so glad you're using the board finally. You're welcome. Yeah, I fucking cued this up just because I knew you wanted me to use the board. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> she's in Paris. Um, she had just gotten out of a relationship. relationship. She's crying. She turned 30, which is a big thing for women because it's yeah. like you're downhill now. Mm. I put air quotes around that. You can't hear that in the podcast, but yeah. it's like mm. you're going to stop being beautiful. It's over for you. Mm. A woman's life ends when she's 30. Yeah. So ridiculous. But I think that's implied there. And she talks to this guy. I also want to point out super clearly that this guy did nothing wrong. Like, I don't even think this enters emotional like uh affair yeah. territory it's like if you see a woman crying and you buy her cake and you talk to her and she falls in love with you that's not really on you right yeah. like i i think i leaned over to may and i was like if you're ever somewhere and a woman is crying and you help her that's not cheating to me yeah. you're good like i you're would sad. rather you help somebody who's crying because like and then she says like over voiceover it's like and he, while he did have other plans that night you know i did try to talk him into yeah spending i said more have dinner with me. with me and he said 
I'm married and yeah. I'm going to have dinner with my wife, but I wrote you a poem. Yeah. And I, I felt like that was very... Incredible kindness. What? Oh, sorry. Incredible kindness. Yes. Yes. I felt like it was soulmate right? Where it's like yeah. sometimes your soulmate isn't the person you marry. It's just somebody you meet and you have this connection and you go, I want to give you something that will help you. Sorry, Angie, you said that your, your soulmate is not somebody you marry, that just somebody you meet. Have a, have it can a, be. Have, have a connection with. Sometimes your soulmate is just somebody that you <laughs> share a podcast with. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. rubbing his wedding ring. Stuart and I are fucking <laughs> going to get hitched after this episode. You really was, reawakened something. Yeah, I, I okay. Uh, I was telling May I had an idea for a short film for a long time, and it's a theory of the universe that I have, which I think is really fun, that... It involves reincarnation where it's like the universe is an experiment and that like it's one person reincarnated over and over, but it's not just one. There's two. Mm. So it's one person kind of experimenting and learning and the other person supporting them. And uh, the idea of the short film would be one of these reincarnations is watching his life with this other person and they're kind of talking about it. And he's like, well, who are you? And it's like they're going through. It's like, well, that's me. And it's like, huh? It's like, well, you were you and your wife. But I was your best friend and I was also your kid and I was that guy at the grocery store. But you were the guy at the fishmonger, right? Where it's like, he's like, was, was I Jesus? It's like you were Jesus and John and Mary Magdalene, but I was Virgin Mary, Simon. Oh, and I was Judas too, right? Mm. Like there is always, mm. it's if you are talking to somebody, it's either you in another life or it's the person who is put on this earth to help you. Mm. Mm. And Chiv, you should watch the movie Past Lives. And it came out this past year. Mm -hmm. Someone we've worked with uh, was one of the eighties on it. Oh, um, it's a very, it's a, I adored it. Um, but it's basically the plot is like, um, to segue because we definitely have so much time. Um, but it's about like this uh, young Korean woman, um, who when she was a child was best friends with this Korean boy, and mm -hmm. they would always talk about how they're going to get married when they grow up, and they'll be soulmates forever. Mm -hmm. And then her family immigrates to the U, to Canada via, and then the U.S. And she eventually reconnects with this person who in her childhood she thought was her soulmate mm -hmm. and like who they had made all these plans in the future. And it's about like just the way of life, how, you know, contrasting the self you imagine in the future versus how mm -hmm. life versus is, is it's are. a bunch of randomness. Yeah. How like she only ends up marrying this guy, this other guy because she runs into him at a Airbnb that she's renting and he happens to rent the other room. And now that's complete randomness compared to when you're a child, you think everything is planned out for you and you yeah. can have a plan. Oh, interesting. I but so much that. of the idea, so much of the movie is also the idea of like your past lives and you're always just every life you're trying to find your soulmate. And mm -hmm. that maybe in this life we haven't reached it yet, but the next one will finally be together. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you'd really like the movie Past Lives. Oh, I'll I'd also endorse it. It's nominated for Best Picture this year. I have to um, super watch it. Quite 100%. good. But anyway, my point being like, Obviously, I personally feel like a soulmate doesn't always have to be who you end up with romantically. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was, I, I just thought that was interesting where it's like, there's this person I love and it's not, um, it's not the person I'm going to be with for the rest of my life. It's somebody I met one night, but it's someone who continues to resonate with me. Yeah. And I'm texting your partner past lives right now. Cool. Thank you so much. She keeps track of all the movies I'm supposed to watch. watch um, this. So it's. So after Mar Mariana. That's when her mom comes in, I want to say. Jeff, yeah. when you're done texting, will yes. you pull it up? I don't well, want to miss anything. I believe her yeah. mom came in before Mariana. I don't think so. I think Did you're I right, Ange, because. No, because it's right after she has that affair. Okay. That she goes to Mariana, and I think is probably planning on talking about it, where she's like, you get it. You're like cool yeah. and hip. And you've never married. Monogamy's a scam. And she's like, dude, you got some problems. Yeah. That's what she says. Exactly. I like quoting the movie. No. But. Kind of though. Like she is saying like. Yeah. I think it speaks to Finn's character that she hits it from an academic standpoint immediately. Where it's instead of being like, oh, this didn't like I've made a mistake or this didn't work for mm -hmm. me. Or like I should like, you know, actually every human is it's impossible for monogamy. Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 bud. Yeah. I think not. You just have to, you, you got some, you got something in your heart and you got to mm -hmm. work on. Um, but yeah. I do think, and she wears that, the red jacket she's wearing through all these scenes. So superb. Um, but then she talks to her mom. Yes. And there, uh, cause she's sitting outside with Mariana and she's like, come in, the weather's going to change. And then she goes home 
And then it's when she talks to her mom. And then right after that is the windstorm. Yes. Yeah. She has the conversation with her mom and her mom's like, I'm marrying your dad. And she's like, I spent my whole life. You telling me that my dad is an asshole. And she's like, well, I'm different now. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. We fell back in love. I don't know what to tell you. Things are different. And it's like, but I shaped my whole world for you around you. I'm also cheating on my fiance. And she's like, never tell him. Yeah. Yeah. Which was fascinating. Yeah. That was where like, uh, my partner heard that line about like, I'm, I'm, I'm marrying your dad. So it's like every divorced kid's dream. I would not say that's true. (laughs) Right. I do not think every divorced kid, like Finn, Finn does not want her parents to get married. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Depends on the, I guess it depends on the situation. Mm Mm-hmm. Depends on the divorce. Some divorce kids would be like, my parents should never be in the same room together. With the utmost respect to May's parents, I don't think they should get remarried because they're also yeah. both married to other people and are much happier. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I went to her mom's wedding this summer. It was yeah. awesome. Right. Um, yeah. She has that talk with her mom where kind of like that, as she's starting to like kind of ground herself in new explorative ways of thinking about love and relationships then this storm hits her oh i thought the storm was at her utmost turmoil she feels this way and then the storm kicks up everything yeah that's what i kind of that's kind of where i mean where it's like she she's thinking that she's not getting any answers then maybe she is getting some answers and then her mom just kind of sweeps the rug up yeah everything gets kicked up and yeah and then like the windstorm it was a very and i'm gonna use a big word here it's a very tolkien-esque you catastrophe the big storm. Yeah. A very like explosive event that changes the story for the better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought it was very interesting how the pages spread out and how everybody gets a little piece and everybody takes care of it and brings it back. I do yeah. like how many pages there are. Yeah. So many pages. It's like hundreds. It's great. And I think, you know, her mom, I think when she's having the conversation with her grandmother and she's like, I have to start over. And it's like it would be easier to start over than it would be to just like go back and reconstruct it. How lucky yeah. to be so non-committal while her mom in the background is picking up her own pages. Yeah. Her mom is committing when she can't. Mm-hmm. Shit's crazy. Shit's crazy. Shit's crazy. And then all of these women who in many other ways have been like jilted by commitment, failed on commitments, come back to give her pieces of yeah. her own thesis. To and, be like, And they all have their own like realizations. Yeah. And like stump, she finds pages in the pond that her husband had dug yeah, for her and she kind of realized like M ends up in the studio. Yeah, he did do this out of he did make this pond out of love for me. Um ultimately. Yeah, she waits in it, I think, for the first time. Yeah. That's the implication. She he did he did try. Um M finds all the artwork of her in the studio. Yeah. The and I that- think the implication with M is that he never painted anybody else. Is that mm-hmm. it's always been her, which Again, isn't redeeming. It's not yeah. about redeeming him, but it is like an understanding. understanding. Fuck. And, and I find some pieces in the DVD case for Morbius. Um, it's good stuff. Look, someone's got to do the bits here. <laughs> Someone <laughs> got to. I, I will say, and you, you, I was going to give this movie a six, but you, you put it up to like a seven for me. I, I'm this, cause I was watching this movie and I was like, well, if this wasn't so sad, it would be a comfort movie for me because the aesthetic yeah. is so amazing. It's very comforting. It's, yeah. and it has I don't m- know if it's not a comfort movie for me now. I don't know if this isn't going to be like a play while I'm working movie to have something playing in the background. It has that, that nice nineties, like warmth to it yeah it's got that yeah. film grain soft yeah. feel i do want to make sure we get to there's the windstorm it all gets back to her mm-hmm. they they almost i think in solidarity finish the quilt it's yes. a 75 hour crunch yeah which may wants to make sure we know that it probably wasn't 75 straight hours they probably took shifts because older women cannot work for 75 yeah. straight hours i said 75 hours probably a low ball estimate because quilts take so much time yeah. uh but they get it done. She finishes her thesis. She finally constructs it and finishes it and commits to it. Mm-hmm. Glady Joe, I, I should take a hammer or something, but she like knocks down all the, the porcelain. The windstorm kind of breaks something in that laundry room full of yeah. all those broken pieces. And then she kind of goes to fit it and drops it. And then she's like, fuck it. And then starts stripping it out. Yeah. You can see her sister like takes it in again. So sisterly, you would never, ever say, I forgive you. Yeah. yeah. But you would just turn as you're holding the hammer and be like, <laughs> like keep I, I, going i fucking love that bit that's, no it was so oh beautiful. my god i was like that's it that's the juice i also think for gladi joe who is like you know i who says to Anne when she's young i don't have an expression for my artistic 
Like I don't have an artistic expression yet the way my sister does with piano. Mm -hmm. And then to say to her husband when she's doing it, artistic expression heals the wounded soul. Mm. Where like quilting isn't quite her art yet, but this is going to be her art. This are out of anger. And that's like, I get to do something out of love with you and people I care about. And it's like, this doesn't, this art doesn't matter to me anymore. Yeah. Preserving this hatred doesn't matter to me. That's an American quilt. And it's also in the laundry room, which is a space for women, right? Like men don't go into the laundry room. I feel like Ange has written a thesis. I Ange has come up with a thesis on this movie. uh, Forget about Finn Dodd. Yeah. Who's Finn Dodd? Who the fuck is Ange Gardner's Finn? Got I'm the, actually Finn Dodd. Ange Gardner. I had that God damn Ange Gardner has got the thesis. Yeah, she's got the thesis. Um, she's got the thesis with the Mises. I do. Jeff, imagine if we did this without a guest. <laughs> this would be the most boring ass. I episode was a little ever. nervous to come in and talk about this movie with two men. I was. Gonna, I did watch it. and I was like, this is a real Barbie movie moment. And I was like, ooh, I gotta talk to Stuart about this movie. You know, I to record it. But yeah, I'm really it, glad no, you guys like this movie. Yeah. If this was just you and me. Very like very not that we episode. we would we would be positive about this movie. I still feel like, but nowhere near uh, introspective as mm. you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you brought vital perspective. I'm us, really glad so. to be here. I I enjoy doing. Uh, this I'm so fucking glad that you're here too. Yeah, I'm not uh, done. I yeah, really no. want to talk about the last yeah. scene. Yeah, uh, because I mean the movie kind of rushes to an end, which I really like. Like the pacing really picks yeah. up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's the morning she wakes up and the crow from Anne's story that. The crow that led her great aunt to her husband and that she looked and looked for all her life and never found, which she said, I found it in my love for my daughter. Yeah. Um, the crow taps at Finn's window and leads her with her quilt to Sam who came out to find her. Mm-hmm. Um, my one critique is just because her whole thing is about being non-committal and then coming into a commitment with her thesis. I would have liked if the crow took her 90% of the way and she went the last 10 Mm-hmm. Instead of the crow leading her right to Sam, because I would have liked if she had made the decision. Yeah. Oh, if she committed to Sam, yeah. as opposed to being like, oh, I don't have to make the decision. Fate led me. Yeah. Or instead of being like, having the bravery to say, no, I know what I want to commit to. I've tried something else, but I know what I want. Mm-hmm. Fuck. It brings her to Sam. It does. It brings her right to Sam. Yes. Uh, what May thought, which I thought was interesting, that it was gonna. T- it took it. The 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 crow takes. The, her to his truck where he's sleeping his vw like van uh and she thought the van was going to be empty and that she would have to go find sam mm-hmm. and i i wanted the bird to lead her like a little bit farther and have her stop and turn and see the truck uh but it takes her right to him he's there and she wraps him in the quilt which is very beautiful it's a really really beautiful booby nice imagery at the end there she yeah. does tell leon no at some point was that before this or no she this? never tells him no Okay. Oh, isn't yes, there some yes, business with the yes, where he's so driving sorry. and she attacks She's him. walking and he's walking back, I think, to talk to her mom. And he's there and he offers her like fruit. And she's like, don't get out of the car. And he's like, why not? And she's like, because I'll kiss you if you get out of the car. And then she goes up to him and she doesn't kiss him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, the apple of temptation. Yeah, heard, heard that she didn't go for it, but also like he didn't get out of the car, right? Like yeah. you didn't really do anything other than not kiss a guy. I would, mm. I wanted for her to be with Sam to make a hard commitment in some way, yeah. burn something, find him, right? But again, I think we talked about before, I, as a viewer, want commitment. I maybe wasn't going to get it. Mm-hmm. Life isn't all about commitments. Nope. Movies are, but life isn't. Yes. Yeah. So she ends up with Sam who came looking for her. Uh, I and he knew where to look. And he how knew to where look. to look. I do feel like I we didn't get resolution on whether or not she tells him. I think after the mom kind of Chekhov's gun a little bit on never tell him. Yeah, and I was like, I don't know if that's the answer, but it never really it didn't imply one way yeah, or another. Yeah, we, we so don't close it off. There's but no she reason does to finish assume her thesis. They didn't. Yeah, yeah. She finished her thesis, and I believe it is just called How to Make an American Quilt. No, no, right? no, it's because it's happen? not about America. Okay. It's like art in South Sudan, right? Or okay. something like that. What it's, do you guys think about the title? I know it's based off the book, but like, where does the American component have to? Oh, uh, these are all patchworks of American lives over the 20th century. I didn't. Yeah. I don't feel like I saw a lot of patriotism in this movie. Yeah. I right. saw a lot more about interpersonal relationships. I think how to make an American quilt sounds a lot better than how to make a quilt. Yeah. There is, I don't know if you guys know, a TV show, I believe, called How to Make a Quilt Out of Americans, <laughs> which is really tough when you're searching the Tumblr tag. I want to be open and honest. <laughs> out of Americans? How to Make a Quilt Out of <laughs> Americans is a title. 
your silence. I will turn you into a quilt. <sighs> How to make an American quilt sounds really good. I think that makes sense, but I... I don't know. I think I would have liked, especially because the poem about making a quilt and having that be the metaphor for love yeah, is Parisian. Right. I would have liked a little bit more juice in the title. It's a little misleading, but I think also keeping it the same as the book is fine. Right. And the book could have more patriotism that I don't know about. Yeah. Right. Sorry. I just have nothing really to add. You're just, no, uh, I'm uh, just pulling uh, up my post. Yeah. I just, you really good. recontextualize this movie for me. I yeah, really, you really, you really like this movie it for me too. I think it was a really, really good movie. Um, obviously, I think I talked about a few of my flaws with it, but I thought, I thought the script was killer. I thought the script itself was pretty killer. I think yeah. a few of Finn Dodd's mm-hmm. lines were not fantastic, but and maybe like the writer just wasn't that interested in. Finn they Dodd's. also might have been using lines from the book, right? It also just yeah. maybe could have been a combination of the way Winona anticipated should we talk about winona herself anymore like i want to make sure you guys are covering what you need for the podcast (sighs) i I guess it's ultimately one of those movies where i really don't have that it doesn't really do much for winona's career so i don't really have much to add i guess not and what does she do next what are you guys talking about next uh, boys Boys. which is one of the worst movies i've ever seen yeah Um, we talked about terrible we it comes out next week but we record sorry spoiler alert next week we we barely talk about boys we mostly talk about dune during the episode it's Mm. really Um, bad um, okay, so this is, I, I was asking May, because this is after she is, she's becoming a little bit of a quote-unquote has-been, right? Like, if if you see a peak in an actor's career, it's, I, I, af, it's behind her now. This is basically at the peak of her Really? Yes. Yeah. Because she, she had just gotten nominated for Little Women the year before, after being nominated for um, Age of Innocence, Age of Innocence pro- the year prior to that. I wonder, when did they start, when did she get attached to this project, though? Because I think it's smart to attach an up-and-coming star to this. She gets it. She's kind of part of the reason this movie gets like made in the way that it does. I guess that's true. She, she's a guarantor at this point in her career. We talked. We've talked about it with like Little Women and um, uh, House of the Spirits and a few others. That like she's now in the in reality bites. She's in the territory where like if she gets attached to a movie, it gets a green light. She's that popular. Okay, and cool. brings that much success to movies. That's interesting. I'd say like once we start getting in a few more movies in like. Alien Resurrection and then what follows I would is say sort of Alien Resurrection is I would say like point. ultimately a peak. Okay. Yeah. Um Alien so, Resurrection is like she's getting established as like now she's gonna lead a major blockbuster franchise and it flops. Does she lead that though? She's being set up to take over. She's being set up to take yeah. over. That means but, something very different but she, though. It's the only alien movie where there's two actors on the front of the poster. That's really interesting to me because I didn't feel like this movie was a peak career movie. Mm-hmm. I think it's like she, the, the peak movies was like Age of Innocence and Little Women. And she's like on the coattails of this peak. Well, she's at, in she's, terms of I her mean, it's influence. also, it's a little bit like White Hot American Summer, right? Where it's kind of like, or uh, Mamma Mia, right? Where you yeah. just make it because you can make it. And it's like your job is to have fun. Yeah. I bet this was so fun to film. Oh, yeah. Career wise for her, it's really just like she wants to start like doing interesting movies, whatever like the scale of the role is. Yeah. And I bet reading the script, yeah. this looked like a great movie. It is a great yeah. movie. I'm, I think a lot of, a lot of great names were attached to this probably because of the strength of the script. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's Maya Angelou. She won't be in so this movie. That's so true. Yeah. I guess also because I didn't know any of the old, like other women's names, I only knew Winona Ryder. That I might be like, I don't know why she's in this movie yeah. because I don't have the context of who these women were. Yeah, like Ellen Burstyn. Very yeah, that, very that, like you guys are better at that kind of movie trivia stuff. That that did not land on me when I watched mm-hmm. it. Uh, to talk about this movie, um, post X. Uh, this movie does come out. It comes out October 6, nineteen ninety five. It's uh, considered something of an Oscar play. Yeah, I um, felt with that with its release date. It ultimately gets a very like lukewarm reception uh, culturally. Yeah, it makes forty one on its ten. Right? Yeah, po- it makes a very good profit for its budget. Yeah, um, but it's th- not a huge amount of money though. Like it wasn't. I don't know if anybody went to go see it twice. Yeah, it's that's like when you're making a ten million dollar forty one is like what exactly the target that you want, um, but it doesn't like exceed. It's not like you know it's making like. 200 million or something like that. Yeah. But especially in the nineties where, you know, the box office made sense, like 40 million is a good amount of money to make on your movie. Yeah. If you I, go think it, I definitely don't want to pan this movie yeah. as like, Oh, it was a failure, but yeah. I was, I didn't expect it to be an Oscar play. Yeah. 
because it in like it was like an Amblin move um, comes out at this time um, in October. It gets pretty decent reception. Um, most part, people are like some of the stories are much more interesting than the others. Winona isn't doesn't have the most interesting storyline in it. Roger Ebert was around. What did he say about it? Roger Ebert said um, he commended the stories involving Woodard and Capshaw for being the most heartfelt, but found the rest of them devoid of any emotional resonance compared to the tales told in the film adaptation of The Joy Luck Club, which actually was about what I was about to bring up because this movie gets a lot of negative comparisons to The Joy Luck Club. What's um, The Joy Luck Club? The Joy Luck Club is essentially a... It's more or less this same story, um, except Oof. it's about Chinese Americans. Oh. Um, it's based on a book from 89. The movie came out in 93. Um, a hugely successful, um, like, culturally uh, movie. Especially well, would, in the Chinese. I would American be interested to see it and see what it does better. Like what what about that movie makes it better than how to make an American quilt? Because I didn't see a lot of technical work that would could have been better in an American quilt. Maybe I I can see what he was saying about like the actors being devoid of emotion. Devoid? Voided? The actors not having enough emotion, yeah. but mm-hmm. I'm look I've never I watched the Joy of Luck Club when I was in middle school because we read the book. But mm. I'll be honest, I cannot remember anything about the story. All right. I'll look um, into it. Um, but I know that um, it, it gets a lot of comparisons to the Joy Luck Club of people being like, well, we just kind of did this story two years ago. Yeah. And now we're doing it again. Yeah. Why are we seeing it again? Was yeah. this anybody's last movie? Because there were a lot of older actors. Um, not that I'm aware of. All these people, shockingly, some of them lived on for like 20 to 30 more years. Yes. Maya Angelou passed away in 2014. Um, we love to see Gene it. Gene Simmons passed away in 2010. Lewis Smith is still alive today. She's 93 years old. She was recently damn, in damn. The Nice Guys. Oh my um, God, Queen. She plays okay. the, the Coke bottle glasses woman who um, Ryan Gosling's working for. Nice. Isn't she also in Twister. She is in Twister. Sorry, that was, that was what Angelica said when she saw her. It's like, oh, Twister. She's oh, lo- yeah, she Angelica lo- loves that movie. She, she, she Twister looks is like your she's Rango. from Kansas. <laughs> Yeah. You know, every I think every girl gets one weird movie. You get one. Yeah. Twister, Rango. I know a few people with Sharknado. Yeah. Oh. My wife just likes sad movies. I know. She likes to watch After Sun. I still have to watch Iron Claw. That, you know, I've been told that's after, going to be. It's, yeah, it's the most fucking Stewart movie I've ever seen in my life. Which yeah. one? Iron, Iron Claw. Claw. It's oh, a recent movie. That, yeah, that's a you movie. Yeah. You could have been cast in that movie, and that movie would have not been any different. Stewart, can I can I tell you? 80% of the lines in the Iron Claw. All I want is to be happy with my brothers. Spend a lot of time with my brothers. That's all I want. That's all I want. Yeah, it's a me movie. I don't I don't it, I don't care about fame. I don't care about success. I just want to be with my brothers father, and sons, play football. Father, and brothers. That's that's me. Just, dad, dad, we'll be your brothers. We got to watch uh Brother Bear. Oh, you oh, yeah. Well, because I feel like every time I come on the podcast I'm like, I want to talk about women. <laughs> I want to talk about women's experiences and then it's like <laughs> We did talk about Bolt. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. Yeah. No women have any experiences in Bolt. <laughs> Miley Cyrus. She did great. Yeah. great movie. Um, oh, you yeah. know what? Also, uh, The Rookie did not have any women in it. Yeah. This is actually the first time you've come on to talk about women. It feels like I've just been doing this my whole life. <laughs> I think you, we, you, oh, and you were also on Gotti to talk about the roast of John Gotti Sr. Oh, so true. Um, so yeah. true. I have been on four times. This I is your fourth three. Time. I forgot about, I always forget about Gotti that everybody was on Gotti. Yeah, five hour episode. It was a good oh, one, one time. Our, one of our great, good, good one time thing. Oh, we'll Stuart, if you don't do think one. we're doing that again, I got plans. Except it's going to be a continuous recording session. All right, we have D and D in twenty minutes. All yeah. right, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. Um, Andrew, do you have any final thoughts? Anything you want to say? No, uh, I kind of feel like I jilted the audience by not talking more about fiber art. Um, but hopefully by the time they check my Instagram, this uh, comes out, I will have converted my Instagram to a fiber art Instagram. So do you want to plug that? I would. Ange Gardner art. Uh, I do needlepoint and knitting and I really, really like the community. I am at a Gardner art as we speak. Thank you so much. Hit, uh, it, hit it with a plug. Yeah. I think my final thoughts on this movie were it's a nineties Barbie movie in which male experiences don't matter. Uh, I really, really loved it. If you watch it again, or if you watch it for the first time, Keep note of all the little things that don't make sense because they make sense later. The movie really rewards you for watching closely. Yes. 
a uh, lovely movie. Um, thank you so much for coming on to talk. Yeah. No, we were happy so, to we be were, here. We were, we were, we were blessed to have you here today. Oh, yeah. This is a real, tra- this is a pleasure. How long have we all been friends? Oh God. Um, 2020. I've known 2020? You since, I've known you since COVID. J- July of 2021. So two Okay, and a so half, we're coming up three. on three years. Yeah. Okay, so next year I can come on another episode. Yes. All right, cool. Well, yeah. I'll see you guys you'll, next you'll year. You'll be on for the next show who and we're covering Redacted. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you guys you guys know we're covering. We're covering. Yeah. <laughs> Um, cool. But yeah, thank you all so much for listening to this episode. Um, as always, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe if you liked what we're cooking with today. Uh, you can pop into our... Uh, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. Pop to the Reddit, r slash Trolting, at Trolting Podcast, uh, at Trolting Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky Threads, Trolting Podcast at gmail.com, at Jeff W. Sweeney on Twitter for me. And then such thanks as always to Becca for our graphic design, Michael Van Bodegum-Smith for the theme music, and have a great week, folks. See you next time. Thank you.